בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוך השם, ברוכים הבאים, all uh, the uh, new faces, old faces, uh, this is uh, משנה פרקי אבות, series, סיום, סיום מסכת, it's uh, שיעור number 177 in this series. Uh, בעזרת השם, tonight we're going to complete the series. Uh, this is a, Baruch uh, Hashem, has been a monumental work. I appreciate all of you coming to the Shurim, watching them online, supporting, donating, everything that everybody that has contributed in any way, shape, or form. Uh, first, I'd like to say thank you for doing it. Uh, this is uh, by far for me the most monumental work I've done in my life. Uh, and I think that uh, as far as this series itself, I think it's been the most in-depth coverage of the Pirkei uh, Avot on video, at least. Be'ezrat Hashem, one day when Hashem, uh, when Hashem desires, we will uh, come out with this series in a uh, book format, in a writing format. We've actually already started working on it over the last year, but it's a lot of content. And uh, the uh, person, for example, that's been writing, uh, typing each uh, shiu, uh, send me a bunch of, uh, probably uh, half of it already or more, in writing. Uh, each year is somewhere in the neighborhood of 30,000 words. 30,000 words. Uh, the shortest year is somewhere around 25,000. Longest, obviously, over 30,000 words. And for anyone who just wants to get an idea of what that means, that's usually uh, 30,000 words is around a third of a big book. A decent sized respectable book. It's about 100,000 words. Uh, not the ones that you buy for $20 in the, uh, you know, in the airports, and it just tells you that the guy killed the girl, and then one day got married to a new one, and lived happily ever after, some fairy tale. Real books. Uh, so, Baruch Hashem, the series has been intense. It's, uh, we covered a lot of ground. We covered uh, a lot of interesting things from uh, the... One of the foundations, one of the foundations of our oral Torah, one of the foundations, uh, one of the pillars of all Musar, uh, the number one Musar book uh, in the world that will ever be, is the five books of Moses, of course, specifically the fifth book, the book of Deuteronomy, Sefer Devarim. Then you have the Ketuvim by uh, Shlomo HaMelech, Proverbs, uh, Kohelet, there's a lot of Musar to learn from them. Maybe that will be a series one day, Bezat Hashem will do. Uh, and uh, Pirkei Avot is uh, right in line. Right in line. Obviously, there has been uh, many other books that have been written after that. Uh, but in every single, thank you, in every single Musar book that you're ever going to read, you're always going to find them quoting Pirkei Avot on a regular basis. In fact, in most Divrei Torah in general, you're always going to find Pirkei Avot in it at some point or another, some very often, some less often, but you're always going to find Pirkei Avot in it. Uh, and uh, the biggest thing is that uh, anyone that's contributed to the shiurim, that's whether they attended or they watched it online or they donated or whatever it is, has to know that you have a share in all of it. You have a share in every shiur, you have a share in every single mitzvah. I know that uh, right now, uh, just on one of our channels, I got a report earlier today, uh, just in one of our channels, we're getting somewhere in the neighborhood of a half a million minutes per month of uh, people learning Torah. Just one channel, Baruch Hashem. Half a million minutes. I mean, you're talking about an enormous amount of time of Torah per month. Just one channel. We're not talking about all the channels. All the channels were probably a few million. A few million uh, minutes every single month. So you're thinking about it. You come to a shul. Sometimes you fall asleep, sometimes you stay awake, sometimes you get scared, sometimes you get encouraged, sometimes both, usually both. Um, and you figure, okay, three hours, I was in a shoe, I remember maybe 30 minutes of it perhaps. Hopefully I'll apply three minutes, but that's it. But it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. The way it works is that you came to a shoe, you watched the shoe, you contributed to a shoe, you're part of all of it. So this shiur is going to be watched hundreds and hundreds of times, thousands of times. People are going to do tshuva because of it. People are going to start doing mitzvot because of it. People are going to change their life because of it. And I can't tell you how many people send letters every week, Baruch Hashem, 
because of this series and how it's changing their life. Some people are converting, some people are doing tshuva, some people are getting married. Some people actually decide to have kids because of it, Baruch Hashem. I mean, there's no end to the amount of Torah uh, that uh, you can get from, from Pirkei Avot. And Baruch Hashem, we've done our best with Siyat Dishmaya. Of course, the whole thing is Hashem to cover as much as uh, we possibly know and even that we don't know. Um, and uh, Baruch Hashem, I, uh, to start off, this is going to be a big thank you to my family, the Reuven family, my parents especially, that every single month they help us as much as possible, even after the robbery. Baruch Hashem, my father continues to help as much as possible. My brothers, God bless them, they work really hard to try to help us as much as possible. So we continue giving the shurim for free. Now, it doesn't cost free. Every shiur costs anywhere between $300 to $1,300, depending on the shiur. Just to have a shiur. Uh, it's a, uh, we don't charge you, we don't charge anybody, but it costs, because there's employees. If you look at our new websites, Baruch Hashem, Team Hashem, just came out with a brand new website last night, or yesterday. Uh, one of the pages you're going to go to, you're going to see the about, the about page. We have a little bit of writing in there, but then you're going to see the team. You know, a few pictures there, a few people decide not to have a picture, which I applaud them for it, because if, it were, if I could choose it, I wouldn't have a picture of me either. Uh, but since you guys know what I look like, so what could I do? <laughs> um, but uh, you see, Baruch Hashem, there's 30 people on the team. 30 different people contributing to the team in one way or another. Uh, some volunteering 100%, some volunteering part-time. Some are not volunteering at all, they just get paid. But in reality, they're still considered volunteering because the chump change that we pay them, they could probably uh, make a lot more money doing other things in life. Uh, but there's a lot of work that goes into every shoe. Uh, it seems easy. You just put on a camera, you press play, and, uh, and it goes. It just doesn't work that way. Life doesn't work that way. Today we also announced that we're making a uh, very big, for us at least, several thousand dollar investment in Africa. We sent a few thousand CDs to Nigeria and a, uh, a few, maybe five, six hundred Ashe Yatsar cards and some posters and uh, books, Baruch Hashem, uh, a lot of uh, interesting things to help Judaism in Africa. Why? Because they're one of the few that answered the message when we said we're giving stuff for free so people could do tshuva. And some people answered from the States, some people answered from different parts of Europe, but they also answered from Africa. Now, uh, the, the uh, original offer wasn't really meant for uh, Africa, because it's extremely expensive. I mean, each shipment, just the shipment alone, the UPS is over $1,000. Just the UPS. Forget about what's in the box. So it wasn't exactly intended for it, but you think about it for a little while, you say, listen, somebody reached out for Torah, and they don't have to have, you know, they don't have money. What are you going to do? Hashem's going to pay for it. So, not the Shem. The Prophet Job has a uh, fantastic conversation with Hashem, and Hashem tells him, Who did me a favor and I'll pay him back right away? Meaning, who did me something and I'll do it before I did it for them? So that's the way it works. Sometimes you just have to show Hashem that you actually believe in Him and you have to make investments into His children before you know how you're even going to pay for it. So, Baruch Hashem, we have a little bit of help from my parents. God bless them. We have help from my brothers. God bless them. We have help from many of you, Baruch Hashem. Many people that are watching, Baruch Hashem. Some people donate $5, some people donate $500. But every single penny, anyone that watches our work every day sees that uh, it's honestly, people ask, how do you do it with such, you know, such a almost non-existent budget? The reality is, is that uh, Hashem makes miracles because we're trying to do the best we can. But um, most of all, the biggest thank you is to my Eshet Chayil, my Kala, my wife, the Rabbanit, God bless her. I think the biggest Mesirut Nefesh, more than me, is her. Because I told you guys several times, uh, the, uh, the life of a uh, rabbi, needless to say, uh, someone that's constantly on the road, someone that's constantly teaching, dealing with people, is not very easy. Especially since many of you have a lot more than just one question in your life. So you ask me more than one question. And then today, it's much easier to ask questions. In the old days, you wanted to ask the rabbi a question, you had two options. One, go to him. Two, send them a letter. Now, not all the rabbis that you wanted to talk to lived by you, so you had to send a letter sometimes, or you had to travel a few days. Today, Baruch Hashem, Hashem wants everybody to have the answers, apparently. So he created WhatsApp. 
and he created email and he created Facebook and he created a lot of different things so you could send 5,000 questions a day and Bezot Hashem get the answers. And Baruch Hashem, we tried to answer the questions. Most of them we answer. Uh, and uh, the best part about it is I know that if people only watch the shiurim, if they just invested as much time in the actual watching the shiur itself, 95% of your questions would not be asked. Why? Because the answers are in the shiur. Not just because it's a, uh, the shiur is long and so on, but just because that's the way Hashem creates the world. That's the way Hashem has His Torah. You're going to have questions in your mind at a time you can get the answer. Where? From the Parashat Shavua. Where? From the current Shiu. That's where it is. You want to find the answers to all your questions that you have right now? You'll find them in the Shiu. And that's the way it worked for my life. That's the way it worked for many people. But sometimes people get scared. They see a three-hour Shiu or they run away. They want a quicker answer. Especially if young kids. You know, they ask me the same question 500 times. I give them the answer and I say, okay, but you have to watch the shield to get more answers. And then they say, well, can I get something quicker? Can I get something faster? People are scared of a three-hour shield, but uh, if you want the answer bad enough, you're going to have to chase it a little further. And uh, I think that uh, the more people realize it, the more they uh, realize that they have to invest some more time into their own life. So with all that being said, we're going to start the... Uh, this year, we have a. Uh, we already started the first half last week in this Mishnah. As I told you, technically the Mishnah, there's a couple of opinions. Some opinions have that uh, the Mishnah was already completed uh, after the second pasuk. Some have it that it's uh, completed with after Rabbi Hanina. Either way, that's the way we're going to teach it because this is a very, very interesting and important lesson to learn from the from the saying that we hear every day in our shuls after there's a shiur Torah, after there's a Dvar Torah, uh, we constantly hear Rabbi Chanea ben Akasha Omer, Ratzah HaKadosh Baruch Hu Lezakot Yit Yisrael, we hear the whole thing and then we feel good about ourselves because the guy that just said it just told me that everybody has a share of the world to come. All Jews have a share of the world to come. And uh, this technically conflicts with more than half of the Torah. So today, Be'ezrat Hashem, we learned a little bit to prepare Be'ezrat Hashem to give you the real answer, not just the uh, answer we've given you over the last few years, but actually going over that actual Mishnah once and for all. Incidentally, as Hashem would have it, this was also the first shiur of the series. But we only covered part of it in the first year. Bezot Hashem will cover the rest of it today. So the Mishnah in Avot starts as follows. Translation. All that the Holy One blessed is He created in His world, He created solely for His glory. As it is said, all that is called by My name, indeed it is for My glory that I have created it, formed it, and made it. As it says in the uh, verse in Isaiah 43, uh, uh, 7, and then it also says in Exodus 15, 18, God shall reign for all eternity. Rabbi Chanina ben Akasha says, The Holy One, blessed is He, wished to confer merit upon Israel. Therefore, He gave them Torah and mitzvot in abundance. As it says also in Isaiah chapter 60, Hashem desired for the sake of, its, of Israel's righteousness that the Torah be made great and glorious. That's the basics of the Mishnah. Of course, you can go over the, every Mishnah in Avot in a minute. You can go over the entire Perkei Avot, like it is actually tradition to go over the uh, entire Perkei Avot from Pesach all the way to Shavuot. Some even go beyond. And they read it on Shabbat uh, during Sudash Lishit or after uh, Shachrit sometimes, depends on the uh, custom of the shul. 
But usually, the most of the time, you see that people read it. You know, it's a uh, superficially. They just read it out loud. Understand what you want to understand. And uh, finished. And everybody feels good about themselves that they just went to another year, and they completed Mishnah Perkei Avot, the whole series, and uh, give your hands a you know give yourself a hand of applause. Or you can go over the Mishnah Avot a little bit more in depth. Maybe spend an hour on each one, let's say. Spend a half hour on each one. Try to understand a little bit of commentary. First time I went through Perkei Avot, that's what I did. Spend a little bit of time into each Mishnah with a little commentary. Or then you can go into it even more. You can spend 5, 10, 20, 30 hours, 30 days, 30 years on one Mishnah. Depends on how much you want to go. And that's what the sages teach us in Perkei Avot. Afokhba ve'afokhba dekulaba. Delve into it and delve into it because everything is in it. Meaning that it doesn't matter how deep you go into that Mishnah, how deep you go into that Pasuk, how deep you go into that Dvar Torah, you're never going to finish. Why? Everything is in it. Everything. So we we'll learn today there's a very horrible status to be in, which unfortunately there are many people like that today unknowingly, of being an apikos. And the Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin says, what is an apikos? Which we know as heretic. What is an apikos? And it gives a few definitions, a few different things that a person needs to do. But in general, it says anyone that goes against the Torah, desecrates the Torah, says he doesn't believe in the Torah, says, no, this is a, uh, maybe it's not from heaven, maybe Moshe Rabbeinu wrote it, things like that. Or maybe this pasuk here, it's not really important. So they say there was four kings that lost their Olam Abba. One of them is Menashe. And the Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin says, how come Menashe lost his Olam Abba? Before he did tshuva, he did tshuva in the end. How come? Please, guys, eat. Eat, it's for you. Uh, how come, how come Menashe lost his Olam Abba? He was a uh, Talmud Chacham. His father was Chizkiah, Kodesh Kodeshim. They said in the Gemara, Hashem wanted to make him Mashiach. It's not like he's some Amaretz, ignorant uh, moron, doesn't know all of it. What happened with Chizkiah? What happened? So Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin says, Please go from the other side. It says, uh, how come? How did it all start? Chizkiah looked at the Psukim in the Torah. He says, well, Moshe Rabbeinu had nothing to do with his life. That he wrote over here that Timna was descendant of Esav, but then also the sister over here. Like what? He had nothing to write else? That's it? That's he has to write about it? And then what? He wrote the Reuven got the dudaim, the, the flowers, the special flowers for his mom, Leah. Well, he has nothing else to write, Moshe Rabbeinu, this is what he wanted to write. Find something with Mashmaut. Why are you writing about Timna? She was just a, a concubine. Who cares about this woman? Who cares that Reuven decided to give his mom flowers? Like, come on, Moshe Rabbeinu, make fun of the Torah. Now, because he was king of Am Yisrael, Rasha, but king nonetheless, a bat call from Shemaim, a heavenly voice came out from Shemaim and says, You see, Menashe, if I stay quiet when you're making fun of my Torah, you're going to think I'm like you. That I think like you. So I'm not going to stay quiet. And he started punishing him. Ooh, what, what punishments he gave him. Now, it all started with making fun of the Torah. So the Rambam writes over there, he says, From here we learn that it doesn't matter whether it's the pasuk in the Torah that says, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad, or it says, Bereshit bara Elokim et HaShamayim et HaAretz, or it says that Timna was the, uh, you know, descendant of Esav, or it says anything else. Every pasuk is just as important as another. Saying that one pasuk in the Torah, oh, that's the one? Wrong. It's a problem. That means you're disrespecting a different pasuk. That's also why it's a wrong minhag. The Chachamim say it's a wrong minhag, especially Rabbi Vadya, Hamash, yelled about it. 
Allah Shalom, that people stand up during the time when they read in Parashat Yitro, they read the Ten Commandments. It's a minag in some, in some uh, places to stand up when the uh, Chazan is reading, the Baal Kohen is reading the Ten Commandments. He said it's wrong. Not allowed to do it. Rambam wrote about it also. It's wrong. Not allowed to do it. Why? Ten Commandments are not more important than Bereshit Vachai Elokim Tashamayim Vataharetz. It's not more important than any other Pasuk in the Torah. Yeah, but it's Ten Commandments. So is everything else. So, meaning over here, we learn what? That to become an Apikos, it's not that you're intending to be a Rasha. You're not intending to be some wicked person, start eating pig on, uh, you know, on, on uh, Yom Kippur. No. A person could literally fall for, for his own lies without even knowing it. And I always like to give you guys real life examples. Two, maybe three days ago, I have a student in Manchester. She sent me a recording of, I don't know if this woman was a Rabbanit or uh, wants to be a Rabbanit. I'm not really sure. I hope she's not a Rabbanit, but I know she wants to be a Rabbanit. She sends people a Dvar Torah, a recording on WhatsApp. Mamash, WhatsApp is either Ganeden or Geinom. 50 50. There's nothing in between. She sends people a response to my shoe. Somebody, she posted, my student posted one of the clips of my shoe that said that Chamushim left Mitzrayim, which is the Chachamim say only one fifth, one fifth of Am Yisrael left Egypt. And some say it's not one fifth, it's not one out of five, it's actually much worse. One out of 500, one out of 5,000. Some even say Midrash Me'am Loez, one out of 500,000 left Egypt. Meaning only two people. Only two Jews out of every million left Egypt. What happened to the rest of them? 999,998. Hashem killed them. Why? They didn't want to get the Torah. They said, we'll take the Torah, but we'll take it here in Egypt. We'll take it here in America. We'll take it here in uh, Manchester. We don't want to go to Eretz Israel. We want to get it here. But Hashem says, go over there. Yeah, but we're comfortable here. We've been here for 200 years. So it's not that they wanted to go against the Torah. It's that they said, we have, we'll take the Torah, but under our own condition. For that, 99%, or at the best case scenario, 80% of Am Yisrael lost their right to live, and Hashem killed all of them during the Makat Choshech. Why did He do it during the Makat Choshech, the, the darkness plague? Because He did not want the Egyptians to see that He's also killing His own people and make them think that in reality they're the same. So that's why he killed them and buried them on the spot so the Egyptians never even saw the bodies. So this is the pshat, this is the this is simple. This is, everybody agrees with this. There's no like doubts here. There's no one says everybody left Egypt. There's not a single opinion in the Torah that says everyone left Egypt. Everyone knows that the majority of Am Yisrael died in Egypt. And some say some really, really harsh things saying these people were reshaim, wicked, da, 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 a lot of not so compliments. So this woman heard this clip, I don't know, it's like a 10 minute clip. And uh, I asked about you. Got you guys better food this time. So this woman responded and she says she is Hasidish. She is, goes to this uh, Hasidish rabbi over there and they follow the Lubavitcher Rebbe and they follow this one, they follow that one, and you can't really translate the Torah to this, because who's to say, this is a religious woman, so I'm warning you guys, who's to say that a person that murders or steals is not going to go to heaven the same way that if I keep Shabbat, I'm going to go to heaven. And this is, again, if she was not religious, then you say, oh, of course, she doesn't know. She doesn't know the difference. She doesn't know Shabbat. She doesn't know Mita. No, no. We're talking about a woman that's extremely religious. Says, what do you mean? You're saying to me that my, she does in the recording. You're saying to me that my grandfather that didn't keep me taught, he's not going to Gan Eden. What, are you crazy? That's crazy thought, she tells me. Only crazy people think like this. Now, this Rabotai what she said may not seem like a big deal to some people, but that 
simple statement, especially since she made it a recording and publicized it to Hashem only knows how many people. Unfortunately, she has to do some very, very serious tshuva to undo what she just did. Why? Because she just went against the entire Torah. The Torah has foundational rules, just like this building would not be here without a foundation. Doesn't matter how big a building is. Every building has to have a foundation. Every building. You cannot have a building with one, two, three, four, five, ten stories without a foundation under it. It's impossible. Torah has a foundation. The Rambam calls it the 13 principles of faith. 13 things that are the foundation of our Torah, which means if you follow them, you're in a good situation. You're good. You could always improve and do even more and all the mitzvot and do it with happiness and so on and so forth. But nonetheless, you're in a good status. If you violate them, it's not that you're in a bad status. You're in the worst status there is. Why? Because if you don't believe one of these 13 principles of faith, in essence, even if you believe in the other 12, it means nothing. It's as if you don't believe in anything. One of those foundational principles of faith is the principle of reward and punishment. That Hashem rewards the righteous and punishes the wicked. This is a must believe. If a person does not believe in this, he is going against the entire Torah. Why? Because that means that you're contradicting your existing belief that everything is good or everything is bad. Whichever one you pick. That everybody gets punished or everybody gets rewarded. Whichever one. You're either crazy or manic depressed. Regardless, you're in a situation where you're contradicting the entire Torah. Why? As soon as the Torah starts, Hashem punishes Adam Arishon. The second parasha, the whole generation sins, Hashem destroys the entire world. And every single part of the Torah, we see somebody die for some type of punishment. And then the Torah goes into the details of why Hashem is punishing them. And Hashem constantly says, that I punish the wicked and I reward the righteous and so on and so forth. Which means that if you think that you could just simply do whatever you want and Hashem doesn't care, that is what's called an apikos. That's a person that's violating the entire Torah. So even if he keeps Shabbat, even if she keeps Shabbat and she's modest and she eats kosher and her kitchen is full of tin foil, she turned her kitchen into a spaceship you know, some people, they put so much tinfoil, they turn the house to a spaceship. I don't know why. Just put two antennas. You don't have to do that. <laughs> I don't know why people do that. A little bit of tinfoil is good. It's healthy. But you said, people send videos of their house. The car has tinfoil. The table has tinfoil. The kids have tinfoil. Everybody has tinfoil. I have no idea what, uh, I mean, I saw a video today of some guy using a blowtorch to blur, burn his table. Who told you to do this? You know, light all house on fire. Pesach is not, it's not that hard to prepare for. It's not that hard to prepare for, but people go crazy. They, uh, another one sent a uh, video asking, uh, do I really need to get this specific tissue or that one? Why? It's kosher for Pesach tissue. I'm like, what, you eat the tissue? It's kosher for Pesach tissue. Oh, this is capitalism at its best. Taking advantage of an ignorant generation. But anyway, this woman apparently is supposed to know. Why? Because she uh, says she's Hasidish and she goes after uh, the teachings of the Lubavitcher Rebbe and uh, her rabbi that she named, I forgot what his name is, and so on and so forth. And she says certain things that she got from different books and she takes this book, she takes three words from it, and that book, she takes two words from that one, and that book, she'll take seven words from there and she'll make a nice shakshuka out of it. And it'll sound like a Dvar Torah. It'll sound like, it'll, to an average person who's not learned, it sounds legit. It sounds legit. Who's, who am I to question it? I don't know. I, I didn't read the whole five books of Moses with commentary. I didn't read all the halachot. I don't know the whole Shukhan Aruch by heart. I'm not a rabbi. I'm not a, it sounds legit. She's saying words that the Arizal said, Ruach, Neshama, she sounds like a Kabbalist. Maybe, so, sounds legit to me. 
until you know what you're talking about. And if you do know what you're talking about and you hear what this woman says, you realize this woman just turned herself into a heretic that is very dangerous to be next to. So I responded to the video. I don't know what her response is to that. But the point is, Rabotai, is that we really need to know what is the truth. Does every Jew have a share of the world to come or not? Once and for all. Does everybody go to heaven or no? no. Does everybody go... So that's the end of the shield. <laughs> she went straight to the end. We have to, we have, give, me, give me a couple of hours to build it up. Did all the Jews that died in the shrine, they lost their, their portion of the world to come? No. They didn't lose their portion of the world to come. They had a Gilgul. Question is, and I'll give the answers. Does everybody have a share of the world to come? Does everybody go to heaven? Does everybody go to Gainom? Does everybody go? Where, where does everybody go? If I was born into a religious family and I ended up being religious, so isn't that like, you know, like a made game type of thing? Like it's like, you know, it's like a fixed game. You know, I came into it already. Whereas another guy, which is actually really me, was born into another religious family. Wasn't religious most of his life. So technically, shouldn't I get like a get out of jail free card? I went to public school. I had girlfriends in high school. I was 13 years old. I didn't think that, you know, there's anything wrong with it. I wanted to be a football player, and then I wanted to be a psychiatrist, and then I wanted to be a lot of other things. Is there anything wrong with it? So if I'm not religious, if I die not religious, is that, so is that my fault? Technically, I was born this way. No? So, Bezat Hashem, we're going to finally get the answer once and for all, who, what, when, and how. Now, for everybody that's new, which Baruch Hashem, I see that there's a lot of new faces. I want to ask you a question, but I actually want an answer. Not like the ones that I hear all the time, they just decide to give me answers. Now, if we go to a doctor, not you, Chas Shalom, somebody else, like some wicked person goes to a doctor, gets sick. They go to a doctor, and really they have some serious disease. They have, I don't know, Shem they have a cancer or something, they have some, I don't know, horrible disease. And the doctor feels bad for them. He says, if I tell the guy that he has this disease and he only has like a year to live, he's going to start crying, he's going to get depressed, maybe become suicidal. It's terrible. If I don't tell him, and I tell him, you know what, everything's okay. Everything's okay. You're fine. Then he won't cry. Is that a good doctor or a bad doctor? Not you. You were here in the shoe before. I want the new people. If he decides, this is his friend, he doesn't want to depress him. If he tells him you're really sick, the guy's going to get depressed for sure. We tell him, listen, you have a year to live because you have this Shem Echem, you have this horrible disease. But if I don't tell him, I don't tell him, then he's going to be happy. He says, oh, wow, I'm not sick. Oh, I'm going to go on vacation now. I'm going to go have fun. So if I don't tell if I'm the doctor, let's say, and I don't tell him because I don't want to depress him, does that make me a good doctor or a bad doctor? Bad doctor. Why am I a bad doctor? Now you have two questions. You have two for the price of one. Ah. Right. So here's the thing. If he tells him, the guy's going to get depressed, but it gives him an opportunity to do something about it. So yeah, he's not going to be happy, he's sick. But that's a reality that exists whether he knows it or he doesn't know it, it exists. If he doesn't know it, then he's going to continue living his life as if it doesn't exist. And that removes his opportunity from doing something about it. Maybe there's a cure. Maybe I could spend the last year of my life doing something I've always wanted to do, but I'm, I wouldn't do it unless I had this opportunity. You know, this guy, if he doesn't think he's sick, he may continue going to work and work overtime because he's saving for some vacation for next year that you know, he's never going to see because he's sick. So by not telling him, I'm destroying his life even worse than what it already is, simply because if I tell him, he will make different choices. At least he has the ability to. He may still do the same thing. He may still work overtime. He may still be whatever. But at least he has a choice. Same thing here. The Torah is not always roses. 
Sometimes there's wonderful stories that cheer you up and motivate you to get out of depression. But sometimes it shakes you up and tells you whether you like it or not, this is the reality. By telling you, I'm trying to be the good doctor. That's going to tell you. You do whatever you want with it. This is why I tell all of my students from all over the world, I'm going to tell you what it says. You do whatever you want with it. I'm not judging you. I'm not a judge. I'm not a jury. I'm not anything. I'm simply providing information. The reason why is because this is the only form of love that exists. A lot of people say, no, why don't you say a loving Torah and tell people nice things? This is actually love. Why? If I didn't tell you, if the teacher doesn't tell, if the doctor doesn't tell, that's not a sign of love. That's a sign of craziness. That's a sign of selfishness. That's a sign of definitely not love. But if somebody tells you, you know what? Listen, buddy, you're sick. You're sick and you're really sick. Do what you want with it. This is the information. Then I have an opportunity to choose. Because now I really know what I'm up against. So some of the things that I'm going to say are not going to be pre- you know, pretty to, to, to listen to. We're not going into any gruesome details or anything, but the point is, is that some of the stuff is sometimes offensive to people. I remember when I first heard some of the things from my rabbi, I got really, really angry because it was very offensive to my reality at the time because it was the opposite of my reality. But if somebody is intellectually honest and wants to at least have an idea of what their real choice is, the truth is the only choice. doesn't matter where you apply it, whether it's in your marriage or it's with uh, your job or it's some other endeavor that you have. The truth is the only choice because at least when you have the truth, you know what you're working with. So the Mishnah starts as follows, and we'll briefly go over what we did last week and then continue into this week and try to finish the whole Masechet. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Hashem, says clearly that He created the world. For what? For His own glory. Meaning that everything and anything that's in this world, if it does not have a way to glorify Hashem's name, it simply loses its right to exist. What is this like? If there's a king, the king has all types of people that work for him, all types of people that serve him. But if somebody says, you know what, king, you're a nice guy, but I don't really feel like serving you anymore. I feel like serving somebody else. I feel like serving Buddha. I feel like serving uh, J.C. Penny. I feel like uh, serving something else. I feel like doing something else. The king says, you may feel like it, but you don't have the ability to do it. Why? That's what makes me king. King dictates the rules. Needless to say, if it's flesh and blood is like that, then the one that's not flesh and blood is the same. So Hashem says that everything that's created in this world is for my own glory. And the reason why is because by you glorifying my name, you will earn not only your right to live, but you also earn the reward that I've been wanting to give you this whole time. Because Hashem is perfect. He doesn't need us. We don't add to Him. We don't subtract from Him. Whether we exist or not is not going to change Him. But he created us in order to give us good. Since he's the ultimate good, the way to fall under that definition of good, you have to create good. You can't be good and selfish at the same time. So Hashem wanted to create good in order for you to see that he's good, in order for him to be good. But in order for him to give you good, he knew that there has to be rules. Because if he just gives you good, if he just gives you everything you want, without any consequences, if you disobey him, then the world will become very, very corrupt. Similar to if you, let's say, for example, all of you are probably going to go into the uh, business world at some point, if you're not already in it, you're going to go into some company, some big company, small companies. Every company has rules. If one of the people that works for the company, doesn't matter whether they work for them for a day or for 100 years, decides that he's going to take all of the company's secrets and sell it to the competitor. How many of you think that he's going to keep his job for long? If you're the boss, he's not going to keep his job. Because reality is he's an enemy. He's violating the rules of the, of the company. 
the company has secrets. They don't want their competitors to have those secrets. So there's rules. So we can't say, listen, he can do whatever he wants because we like him. No, because he, he's putting the whole ship at risk. Same concept here. Hashem has rules. He wants to give you good, but there has to be conditions. Those conditions are simply that if you do what he says, you will get rewarded, not just in this world, but eternally. If you don't, the opposite. So Hashem said that everything that you see in the world, I created it, I created it for you to use it to glorify my name, I created it for you to connect to me, and if you look at the creation in detail, you'll see that there is no end to the ways that you connect to Hashem. Anyone that looks at the heavens, you look at the sky, within a few minutes you realize how great the world is, simply because you realize that it looks blue. The sky looks blue, but it's not. It's clear. But it's a reflection of the water. But why does Hashem create it that way? Our Torah tells us He created it that way because He wants you to think, when you look at the water, think of have the heavens, think of the sky. Why? Because He wants you to think of the Kisei kavod, the heavens above it. Why? Because that's what it looks like. It's an impression of that. It's that color. To constantly give you a way to connect to Hashem. But also realize that if somebody built a chair, you don't have to be a genius to come to the conclusion that somebody had to put this chair together. It didn't by, come by itself. If somebody has a table, the table was, did not create itself. If somebody has a watch, the watch didn't create itself. And so on and so forth. Someone looks at the sky, he realizes very quickly the sky couldn't have come by itself. Not just because of our religion, but simply because of logic. Because even if you want to believe in what the, many of the heretics of the world like to believe, which is to justify their behavior by saying that everything came from some explosion, even if you want to believe in, let's say, the expansion and uh, Darwin's theory and the evolution and all of that stuff, even those scientists cannot explain where it all came from. They all fail at creation. You go back, you know, everything has a starting point. So if you go all the way back to the beginning of their theory, they say that everything started from one cell. The question is, even if you want to believe in that one cell, starting everything else, where did the one cell come from? Couldn't come from nothing. Somebody had to create the cell. So Hashem said that I created everything in a certain way for you to u- utilize that creation to connect to me. Everything in the world that exists, there is a way to look at it and connect to Hashem to it. Your problems, your glory, your good, your bad, your marriage, your divorce, your uh, children, your shoes, everything. Everything there's a way to connect to Hashem. Now, Rabbi Harina ben Akasha says the following. He says that the Holy One, blessed is He, wanted to make Give Am Yisrael a big present, an opportunity to not only inherit an eternal good, but also a way to live a life of good. By the way, whoever has access to, wants to go to the air conditioner, so I don't melt by the end of this year, lower it to zero. I mean, 70. Please. Okay. I don't know, I'm the only one melting here, apparently. So, Rabbi Chayna ibn Akasha says, the Holy One blessed is he wished to confer merit upon Israel, and therefore he gave them Torah and mitzvot in abundance. So Rabbi Chayna tells us something. He says, listen, Hashem wanted to give you a present. He wanted you to have a lot of merits, and therefore he gave you a lot of Torah. Now to the average person, I remember my old self, when I looked at it, I said, wait, hold on a second. He wanted to give me a better life, and therefore he gave me 620 mitzvot? 613 from the Torah, 7 from the rabbis. If he wanted me to have such a good life, give me no mitzvot. <laughs> I have a get out of jail free card. I can do whatever I want. And that's the normal mentality. The normal mentality looks at the mitzvot as something that's like, it's like a sack of like potatoes that's really, really heavy. That even if you carry it all the way to the destination, what is he going to give you? A $2 tip? Like what's the best you're going to get? It's like heavy, I don't really want to carry it, I don't really want to do it. Who wants to wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning and go to shul? 
Who wants to wear a specific type of clothes to be modest? Who wants to every day open this book and read it? I mean, can I just read whatever I want? Who wants to be told what to do every single second of their life? The minute they wake up, they have to thank Hashem. They go, before they go to sleep, they have to thank Hashem. In the middle of the day, they have to thank Hashem. You're constantly talking, like, can I just do whatever I want? That's the mentality. That's the mentality of almost 8 billion people today. But this Mishnah tells us the opposite. This Mishnah tells us that our logic is wrong. In fact, all of these mitzvot are the biggest present that Hashem ever gave us. How so? First and foremost, everybody that's lived long enough knows that a human being, like anything else, but especially a human being, in order to succeed in life, requires structure. You have to have structure. You have to have a system. You have to have some type of program in order to succeed in life. You have to have a misgeret. Misgeret is like boundaries. Because if, if there is no boundary, you will, you will simply roam like an animal. If you have no boundary when it comes to modesty, then what you're going to do is what some crazy people do today. Somebody publicized, thank you, this game is working. Somebody sent a, uh, or publicized some, uh, some uh, I don't know, some, I guess they call it, it's a crime. A woman got upset at a clerk at some restaurant because he didn't give her the coffee or, I don't know, something. And they have her on video. Don't look for it. They have her on video that she got so upset she decided to do what the worshippers of the Baal used to do. There, was, there used to be an idol called Baal. Most disgusting idol worship in history. Why? Because the way to worship this idol was to defecate and then throw your feces on this idol. That's how you worship it. This is what this woman did three days ago. She got upset at the clerk. And that's what she did. She took her feces. She actually, Mamash, next to She threw her feces on the guy. Poor, poor guy. What do you do? Now, what it was, how do you get to such a level of craziness? By the way, this is, more, this is 100% mentally insane person. The Gemara says, who's crazy? Somebody that plays with his feces. That's a crazy person. That's how you know. Somebody that plays with their feces, for sure he's crazy. Or somebody that goes to the Bet Kvarot. Somebody that goes to uh, the uh, cemetery at night. That's also a crazy person. But the point is that this woman, this is, a, this is a woman in, what, 2019? Modern, iPhone, spy phone, spaceships, all that stuff, all this modern. She is doing something that a couple thousand years ago people used to do on a regular basis. Meaning nothing is new under the sun. Everything is the same. Nothing's changed. People are still disgusting. Why? No border. No boundaries. No boundaries. Obviously, None of you are like this, but you can see how certain people can break every rule under the sun. This is what happens with all of these rapists and pedophiles that you hear on the news, Hashem Echem, almost every day. Almost every day. That's why I always recommend to people, don't ever watch the news. Don't ever read about the news. It's the most depressing in his... Every day gets worse. Every day some idiot decides to take advantage of a little kid... Every day some pedophile decides to do something. Some parent kills their kids. Every day is more depressing. It's the worst. Than, it's like, I don't know why people do this to themselves. They watch the news or they read the newspaper. I think anybody that touches a newspaper, I love you again, you say, you should do that till you're dying. You should wash your hands, purify them. It's so, it's so disgusting. The news is depressing. Why does anybody watch it? And it gets worse. And you see, why does it get worse? Because it gets closer and closer to home. Closer and closer to home. Down the street it happened. Next county over. Next, like it's not only like in the old days, technology wasn't like it is today. So you heard about crazy stories, but they happened somewhere else. Now, since every single person is a cameraman, every single person is a journalist on Twitter, on Facebook, on something, no crime goes unanswered. Everything is out there. There's no boundaries. People put all their garbage on the internet. Without boundaries, a person is bound to have a miserable life. 
And the reality is that by the time he realizes that this life is miserable, that this life is depressing, that this life is hopeless, it's too late. He's already tarnished his name. He has to move to a different country, change his name, change his looks, change everything. People do all that stuff, but apparently they continue doing the same thing. Now, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us these rules not to restrict us in order to harm us, but to restrict us in order to protect us from ourselves. A woman that knows that she has to be modest because God said so, that's, first of all, that's enough of a reason. But needless to say, that woman that knows that she has to be modest automatically knows, wait a minute, so modesty is not just clothes. Obviously, I, have to, I can't walk around half naked. I can't walk around like a cow is naked and I'm naked. I can't do that. That's number one. So automatically, I look different than everybody else. Automatically, the woman that's walking around with, uh, you know, pretty much no clothes on, which the previous generation called underwear, she walks around like that. People look at her and they only see one thing. They see something that no normal father would ever want their kids to, 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 to look like that. On the other hand, a person looks at me and I am modest. Okay, he's thinking maybe I'm marriage material, maybe I'm a, cl- a classier person. They're not thinking that right away. They're thinking something else. Already there's two descriptions. No one looks at the Queen of England. Even though she's not Jewish, no one looks at the Queen of England and says, you know what, Psh, wow, she's hot. No one says that. No one says that. No one. Why? Because she's modest. You're never going to see a picture of the Queen of England with a bikini. Never going to happen. A whole life. Never in a bikini. Why? Because she's a queen. Queens don't walk around with bikinis. Abat Israel is a much bigger queen. Queen of England is queen of some country that uh, may or may not last very long. Abat Israel has Chelek Eloka Mimal. Has a piece of God himself in her. She's his daughter. Whether she likes it or not. So, you're never going to see a queen of England walk like that. Why do you walk like that? So a woman that knows, okay, God said I have to be modest. He must have a good reason. Secondly, modesty is not just a close. Obviously, it's also behavior. So even if I'm angry at the clerk or I'm angry at the uh, boss, or I'm angry at uh, my husband, I'm never going to do things that will bring shame to my Father in Heaven. I'm never going to do something that's going to bring shame to my family. I'm never going to do something that's going to bring shame to my community. I'm never going to do anything that's going to bring shame to myself. So that automatically makes the person watch their mouth, limit their language, limit even their talking to a certain extent, limit where they go, limit where they are, and so on and so forth. Where you see that these boundaries are something good for you, not bad for you. Same thing goes with food. If you're like, for example, like the Goim, they have all these videos where people like to gross you out, so they send these videos, and you see what the Goim eat. A few months ago, somebody uh, sent me a video of a, uh, some type of Asian woman eating live mice. A plate, a bowl, a bowl of live mice. They're alive. It's not enough that you're eating mice. They're alive. Last time I told you, another one was eating live octopus. And the octopus was like covering a whole face. All types of strange foods. In, uh, it's either Tibet or um, one of these Asian countries. Breakfast. You have a line out the door. People drinking the poison of snakes. For breakfast. You drink coffee, they drink poison of snakes. Why? There's no boundaries. Everything that moves, we eat. If it doesn't move, we kick it, then we eat it. That's their, there's no boundaries. Everything that's around, we eat it. Except if it's a car. We don't eat cars. It's unbelievable. Yet. Yet. He's right. There actually used to be a car. There was a guy. In a Guinness Book of Records, he ate a car. There is. Be mad. He had a car. He had a plane, actually. That's how he got to the beginning of his book of record. He had a whole plane. 
took him, I don't know, 30 years to eat a plane. So when there's no boundaries of what goes into your mouth, guess what? Cannibalism is not such a bad thing. Less than 20 years ago, a famous politician or a professor in Eretz Yisrael died and left a will. In his will, he had one request. Please do not bury my body. Cut it up into pieces and feed it to all my friends. And whatever is left, throw it to the lions in the zoo. This actually happened less than 20 years ago. It was celebrated. There was an idiot and the paper. Embarrassment for the country. Embarrassment for the nation. This is what they did. They cut up his body. His friends ate some, but there was still a lot left. They threw it to the lions in the zoo. Not a single lion wanted to eat it. They threw it to the tigers. Not a single tiger wanted to eat it. They threw it to all types of... No one wanted to eat it. Who ate it? The pigs. The pigs were the only ones that ate it. When there's no boundaries, these unusual things that I'm telling you become the norm. A person looks at a seven-year-old innocent little girl thinking, oh, she's going to be my wife. This happens every day. Just today, there was two cases like that reported in the news. Here in Florida, I'm talking about. I'm not talking about in the world. world, Shem Yachem. So, you see that these boundaries make you look at the world with a certain lenses, certain restrictions. You need them. Or else you become like them. And you can't say, no, no, but I'm a good person. What makes you good? Hitler thought he was good. He said, he wrote in his book, I'm doing the world a a service. According to his own definition, he was perfectly good. So if you're the one that's going to define good, who's to say you're right? Hitler thought he was good. Napoleon thought he was good. Martin Luther thought he was good. A lot of murderers and rapists think they're good. A lot of people think that everybody thinks they're good. Everybody wakes up in the morning and says, oh, I'm such a good person. Everybody thinks they're good, according to their definition, which means that it cannot be your definition. The only one that matters is the definition of the one that created you. He defines what's good. And that creator says, you want to be good? You have to follow my rules. Why? Because those rules will make you good. Where even though you naturally are not good, naturally you have an evil inclination. Naturally, you want to do bad things. You look at something, you don't have the money for it, naturally you want to steal it. You look at something your friend has, naturally you're jealous. Naturally, you're jealous. You see, she got married before you, naturally you're jealous of her. You see, he got married before you, naturally you say, I don't know, I should have had her. Naturally, you look at things in a certain way that's evil. That's everybody. Everybody has evil in them. The only way to be good is by having this misgeret, these boundaries. But the only way to know what these boundaries are is by the Torah. So Hashem said that I gave you all of these mitzvot. It seems like they are a burden, but in reality, they are the biggest gift you can possibly have a person that actually starts following the mitzvot in the beginning it's a little difficult because there's a learning curve just like there's anything else but eventually they start realizing that they're benefiting from this new lifestyle the rest of their family is depressed or is an anxiety but they know that there's a father in heaven that's following and caring about everything that they do Everybody has problems. They have problems and their non-religious friends have problems. Their non-religious friends that have problems have no answers either. You have problems, but you have answers. What's the answer? The, what, the problem came from the, is the same place that we'll have a solution to. So with all of that, Rabbi Chayna ben Akashia says that Hashem wanted to give merit to Am Yisrael and gave them a lot of mitzvot. But before all of that, he says that all of Am Yisrael have this share of the world to come. All of this 
all of the people have a share of the world to come. And this confuses a lot of people. Because if I have these boundaries, it sounds good, but if I don't want to, I'm still okay, right? So now we're going to learn what does it actually mean? What does it actually mean, a share of the world to come? Who has it? Who doesn't have it? Now, in Parashat Bechukotai, which we're going to read in a few weeks, in every Bet Knesset, the book of Leviticus, Hashem tells us about two different things. He says, if you do good, you will get rewarded. It gives you a countless amount of blessings. If you do bad, you will get, Shem Echem, countless amount of curses, punishment. But he says something very interesting. He says, I'm going to give you signs. When you're not following what I say, I'm going to give you different indications that I'm not happy with you. All of a sudden you're a little sick. All of a sudden you lose money. All of a sudden there's a divorce. All of a sudden there's a lot of things happening. There's a car accident down the street, almost hit you too. There is a uh, loss, almost affected you. A lot of things happen. Things happen in the world. There's a tsunami in India, and you think that only India is responsible for it, not you. There's a building in France, just got burned down. You think that only they are at fault, and so on and so forth. It says, If you treated me with casualness, I will treat you with double casualness. So the sages explain, what does it mean, treat me with casualness? If you start looking at everything in the world that's happening, the good, the bad, the ugly, and say, oh, this is just mikre, this is just happenstance, it just happens, a tsunami happens, an earthquake happens, death happens, disease happens, fire happens, all this stuff happens. Oh yeah, your friend's sick, oh, it happens, people get sick. Oh, this guy died, ah, it happens, you know, people die. Oh, this guy just lost all of his money. Yeah, you know, he made a bad investment. It happens. People make bad investments. They lose all their money. Oh, they got divorced. Yeah, you know, not everybody works out. Not everybody's meant to be together. And you have an explanation that rationalizes the whole world. As if this is the way it happens. Hashem says, for that type of attitude, I will treat you with double casualness. Meaning, I will cause enough damage in your life to show you it cannot be a happenstance. It cannot be a coincidence. It cannot be something that just happened because you're going to see that you're the only one that's being affected by it. Everybody else is dancing except you. Everybody else is celebrating except you. It's like there's a party, but you're the only one that's depressed. That's the punishment. Why does Hashem want to punish you? If He wants to punish you, He just, just kill you, no? He says, no, no, no. I'm punishing you to save you. I'm giving you the slap in order to get your attention. But it seems like the first slap didn't get your attention. The second slap didn't get your attention. The third slap didn't get your attention. I have to start hitting you harder. Why? Because you're not... Everything that I tell you, I cause an earthquake uh, in a different country, you think it's just because of them. I cause a financial crisis in the next state over, you think it's just because of them. I cause a divorce next door to you, you think it's just because of them. I cause something even in your own house. And you think, oh, it's just, it happens. Everything, you have a rational way to explain it. So therefore, I have to start doing some, I have to go up notch. You become a special case. So, Rabbi Hanina, on one end, tells us that Hashem is trying to reward us with these presents called Torah and Mitzvot with the answer to every question you could ever have, whether it's scientific question, medical question, marriage question, business question, everything and anything you have, the answer is in the Torah. But at the same token, if you don't follow it, He's telling you something completely different. He's telling you, if you don't follow it, I'm going to have to punish you for it. So where does the every Jew has a share in the world to come fit in? Where does that argument fit in? Now, that Mishnah that everybody repeats as their justification to continue doing whatever they want is in the Gemara Masechet Sanhedrin. 
And as I've told you guys many times over the years, the part that we say at the Bet Knesset, that every Jew has a share of the world to come, or that we say at the end of a Masechet, that every Jew has a share of the world to come, it's not the whole Mishnah. It's just the first verse. So Bezat Hashem today, we're going to go over the entire Mishnah and try to see what does it actually really say. So the Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin, this chapter of Masechet Sanhedrin is called Perek Chelek because it's after the last couple of chapters in Masechet Sanhedrin discussed different punishments that people that violate the Torah. If somebody steals, that's what he gets. If somebody rapes, that's what he gets. If somebody murders, that's what he gets. And so on and so forth. But until now, the punishment that they were talking about was punishment for people that even if somebody murdered, they technically technically still have a share of the world to come. Meaning that, yes, they get punished in this world. Yes, they get punished in the eternal world. They go to Genom. They suffer there for an X amount of time. But they still will eventually get heaven. They still will have a share of this world to come, we call it. This eternal world world of goodness. And there's countless different sins that a person can do against the Torah. And it goes over all of them. It says this one did this. He gets punishment of strangulation, of a fire, of this or that, whatever it is in the world. And we have the Sanhedrin. But technically, even after he dies and he gets punished in, uh, in the real world, that will end at some point. After a month, after a year, after a thousand years, whatever it is, it will end. And then he will go to heaven. Or he'll have reincarnate and try it again and so on and so forth. But the point is that it's not an eternal punishment. This Perek which is chapter 11 in the Masechet Sanhedrin, some have the, uh, like the Rambam used a different one, the Yerushalmi says chapter 10, but anyway, it's page 90. 90a in the Gemara Masechet Sanhedrin. And this is what it says. Kol Yisrael yesh lehem chelek le'olam haba, shenemar ve'amech kulam tzadikim. לעולם ירשו ארץ נצר מתאי מעשה ידע להתפאר ואלו שאין להם חלק לעולם הבא האומר אין תחיית המתים מן התורה ואין תורה מן השמיים והאפיקורוס רבי עקיבא אומר אף הקורא בספרים החיצוניים והלוחש על המכה ואומר כל המחלה אשר שמתי במצרים לא אשים עליך כי אני אדוני רופאך אבא שאול אומר אף ההוגה את השם באותיותיו שלושה מלכים וארבעה אידיוט אין להם חלק לעולם הבא שלושה מלכים ירבעם אחיו מנשה מנשה יש לו חלק לעולם הבא שנאמר וישמע תנחו וישיבהו ירושלים למחותו למלכותו ישיבו, ולא לחיי העולם הבא, ישיבו ארבע ידיעות בלעם ודואג ואחיתופל וגחזי. אין להם חלק לעולם הבא. Explanation of all of it will go detail. All of Israel has a share of the world to come. As it's stated in uh, the verse by Isaiah, chapter 60, verse 21. And all of your people, meaning all of Israel, are righteous. And forever they will inherit the land. The branch of my plantings, my handiwork in which to take pride. However, the following who do not have a share of the world to come are one who says that there's no reference to the resurrection of the dead in the Torah, or the Torah is not from heaven, or an apikos. And Rabbi Akiva says anyone who reads external books, we'll explain what all of this means in a moment. Or anyone who incants over a wound and says a verse from the Torah that uh, says that uh, all the diseases that I have placed upon Egypt I shall not place upon you because I am Hashem your healer. And Abba Shaul says anyone that pronounces the name of God according to its letters. And now the Mishnah lists a 
few individuals, specific individuals in our Torah that have lost their share of the world to come. Three kings and four commoners. Three kings were Yerovam, Achav, and Menashe. But then Rabbi Yudah says, no, no, Menashe actually has a share of the world to come. He did tshuva, and then he provides a verse that proves it. And then the four commoners were Bilam, Doeg, Achitofel, and Gehazi. So let's... Un- we see a Mishnah in the Torah that technically starts off with great news and then depresses us immediately. Why? It says, wait a minute, everybody has a share of the world to come. Hooray! Then he says, no, accept these people. So first and foremost, let's actually understand what it says. What does this verse actually mean that all of Israel has a share of the world to come and your people are all righteous? Forever they will inherit the land. What does that actually mean? What do the Chachamim say? What? We all know that not everybody's righteous. So it's specifically talking about Am Yisrael. It doesn't matter whether you're secular or you're religious. Everybody knows one guy or one girl that's just truly evil by everybody's definition. Everybody knows somebody. So you have a verse in the Torah that says, wait, everybody's righteous? It's not possible. So what is it referring to? This pasuk is saying once the world ends, the messianic age and everything, once everybody's in Olam HaEmet, there, everybody's righteous. And they will inherit the land. What's the land? The land is eternity. The land is Olam Abba. It's not referring to this world. It's not in referring to, to Eretz Israel. It's not referring to America. It's not referring to, um, I don't know, any other place in the world. It's not even referring to people in this world. It's referring to anyone that ends up in this land, this chosen, this place. Oh, those are the righteous. What do you mean? They're all righteous? Yes, that's why they got here. So the complete understanding of this verse that we say before Shabbat and during the week, most people don't even know what it means. But to elaborate, the Mishnah says, wait a minute. Remember, the last few chapters, we went over a bunch of people that were murderers and rapists and thieves and so on and so forth. They all got punished. So where do they fall? Oh, they have a share of the world to come. So you're saying that Everybody has a share of the world to come, including them? He says, yes, but there are some people that don't. And who are they? Here are those people. First and foremost, it says, anyone, these are the people that do not have a share of the world to come. And it gives the first condition. The first condition is one who says that there's no reference to the resurrection of the dead in the Torah. All Jews have to believe the 13 principles of faith. One of them is that eventually there will be a resurrection of the dead. The Mashiach will come. And then after that, some say 40 years after the Mashiach comes, the dead, the righteous, will resurrect. Some actually have an opinion that everybody will resurrect. The righteous will resurrect and the wicked will resurrect. The righteous will resurrect and get rewarded. The wicked will be resurrected in order to see the reward they're not going to get and get punished even further. Which, Shem Yachem makes the punishment even worse. So, it's enough that you're not getting what you want. It's even worse to see your enemy get it. And if you're wicked, the righteous is your enemy. So, so the Mishnah says that those people that don't believe that there's resurrection of the dead, simply, you believe in the entire Torah. You believe in Shabbat, you keep Shabbat, you keep kosher, you're modest, you give tzedakah, you donate a million dollars a year to yeshiva, you are very, very gracious, you're very, very kind, but you're saying to yourself, listen, I don't see any verse in the Torah that clearly says that there's going to be resurrection of the dead. That's it. You just lost Ulamah. And that, that's it. Doesn't it? You have to publicize it. You have to publicize it. That's it. That's how simple it is to lose it. That's how simple it is to lose it. That's why knowing, like having knowledge about what it says in the Torah, what's to do, what not to do, especially, is so critical because you could be a religious person but still not have Ulam Abba because your religiosity has a ideology that's simply wrong, which unfortunately today, there are many of them. Like, for example, this guy that calls himself a rabbi in Manchester who decided to publicize in a new article a week and a half ago that 
I want all my Orthodox rabbi friends to know. I know you may look at me as and not like what I say, but you should support me. Why? From now on, I'm going to officiate gay weddings as an Orthodox rabbi. Now, this is not that strange if you actually think about his rabbi, Milvis, who teaches Christianity in his schools and brings the Muslims to his Beknesset. It's not that strange. Who wrote today or yesterday that it's a very sad event to see that the uh, cathedral, whatever it's called, in France, what is it called? Notre Dame. Well, uh, was destroyed. Notre Dame, the football team, is better. Anyway, the, uh, he saw this building of idolatry destroyed. He says, oh, this is so horrible. What a tragedy. But this shows that no power in the world can overcome the uh, you know, human spirit. This is what he writes. You know what you're supposed to do when you see such a thing as a Jew? You're supposed to do a blessing. When you see a church destroyed, you're supposed to do a blessing. May Hashem destroy all of the idol worship from this world. That's what you're supposed to do. But the head rabbi of England is saying he's sad. Now why? Why is it that we are so aggressive, they call it? Because that's what Torah says. Because if you look at the history of this Notre Dame place, 777 years ago, they took 24... uh, uh, Carriages, horse carriages full of our Torah and burned them. They had a policy to kill Jews on an annual basis. They called Christmas. They did so many things that are horrible that's implanted in the church that they even have two statues on the building. They had two statues on the building. One was of them, representing them. One was representing the Jew. And the Jew has a snake covering his face. This is not the friends of Am Yisrael. We may not be at war like you think. We're not not shooting guns at each other, but we're not friends. To say this is sad simply shows you have no idea what Judaism is. You have no idea of our history. You don't realize they've been killing us in cold blood for 2,000 years. Now, maybe you don't want to be aggressive and talk about it on the internet and make a video about it, but at the very least... Don't say anything. Don't say anything. To say that you're sad about it, we should support it, and so on and so forth, that's sad. And unfortunately, many rabbis are doing it right now. Same thing like they did with that event in Pittsburgh. Same thing like they're doing many, many other times. We've become so liberal that we don't see much of a difference between the Jews and the Green. But the Green will always see a difference between the Jews and the Green. So... When a person simply looks at the Torah and says, you know what, it's not literally there that there's going to be a resurrection of the dead. Hashem says that lack of belief that I will resurrect the dead has a specific punishment. You don't believe in the resurrection of the dead, you will not be resurrected. That's it. That's the punishment. You don't believe that I can do it because you didn't see it happen and you don't believe that this is what my Torah says? Okay, no problem. No problem. The punishment is, you will not be resurrected. You will not have eternity. So, the Chachamim asked in the Gemara, why is this? This is a heavy punishment. Okay, so he messed up on one thing, but he kept Shabbat. Okay, he messed up on one thing, but he kept kosher. He donated a lot of money to this place. He donated a lot of money to the homeless. He helped a lot of people. The Gemara says, yes, he may have helped a lot of people. He may have kept Shabbat. He may have been very nice and everything else. But it wasn't for the right reason. Because if his, his ideology is that if it's Hashem doesn't see it literally, it doesn't exist. If the say to say it, it's not enough, that means his ideology is against the Torah. His ideology is his own. He's created his own religion. With that type of mindset, there's no way that he's going to belong in the same place as Rabbi Akiva and the Baalei Atosfot and Moshe Rabbeinu and all of the righteous people in the world that have sacrificed their life for the sake of the Torah. There's no way he belongs in the same place, especially not eternally. 
Because that's one of the foundational principles. The second thing is, somebody that says that the Torah is not from heaven. Torah is not from heaven. Now, a person that says something relatively simple. He says, this five books of Moses, genius. I couldn't write something better myself. But I think Moses wrote it. I'm not saying uh, it was written by some guy a few years ago. I'm saying Moses wrote it 3,000 years ago. I don't think God wrote it. Or better yet, I believe what Moses wrote, but the Gemara, that's the rabbis. That's, I, I don't believe in that. I don't believe in that. So it's not just the written Torah, but also the oral. The oral explanation. A person that denies the Torah that was transmitted to God, by God to Moses loses their share of eternity. Because this too, again, is one of the foundational principles of our Torah. It's one of the foundational principles of our inter- entire religion. If you only believe in the things that are written in the five books of Moses, but you don't believe in the things that are written in the rest of the Tanakh, or you don't believe in the oral Torah, then you're bound to live a life that's the opposite of what Hashem's will is. Simply because you will not know what the five books of Moses say without the rest of it. Now, in order for a person to gain Olam Abba, they could only do it through Torah and mitzvot. They could only do it through having merit. They have to fulfill the Torah, do the mitzvot. That's the only way to get to eternity. Hashem is not going to want somebody that hasn't connected to Him for 50, 60, 70, 80 years to be next to Him for eternity. Makes sense. We weren't friends. We weren't related. We weren't talking for 80 years. For 80 years you ignored me. All of a sudden you want to be friends for forever? Not interested. So, when a person denies the Torah, he's denying Hashem. And here we see that if he simply denies something what most people take for granted. They just decide, no, no, I believe in the five books of Moses. I just don't believe in Genom. I just don't believe in uh, reward and punishment. I just don't believe that Rabbi Akiva was really as great as you say he was. I just don't believe that uh, someone that uh, looks at a woman thinks of her in an awful way all the time because the Gemara says it. I don't believe all that stuff. I believe, you know, some things that I believe, some things I don't believe, but I don't believe everything. I believe whatever makes sense to me. A simple statement like that, a simple ideology like that simply removes that person, that soul from eternity. Why? Because that means that every deed that you do, even if it's good, even if it's predominantly a good thing, like you gave charity or you helped somebody out or whatever it is that you did, you didn't do it because God said so. You did it because it made sense to you. And the Rambam explains that even a goy that follows the seven Noahide laws, if he only follows those seven Noahide laws, only because it makes sense to him, he doesn't get a lamba. If he does it because God said so, then he gets a lamba. Now, the next part is an apikos. Apikos. So, the general understanding and how it's used around our Torah of what what is an apikos, they give us several examples. The term apikos is commonly used to include anyone who denies the existence of God or his unity or worships idols or intermediaries between man and God like Muhammad, for example, or uh, Jesus or Buddha 
or denies the, or somebody denies the prophecy or God's awareness or there was no need for the Mishnah to uh, uh, there was no need for the Mishnah to state that such people were uh, those specific people don't have a share of the world to come it's just simply a because defines all of them anyone that in essence is violating the entire Torah with these foundational issues but then the Gemara in page 99b goes into something more specific Chachamim asks, oh, give me an example give me an example of an apikos I say one example of an apikos someone who embarrasses a Talmud Chacham so I said, oh a rabbi yeah he's a moron don't listen to him that's an apikos he starts a Facebook page and he starts talking against righteous rabbis not wicked people righteous rabbis makes fun of them he decides to make a comment on one of the videos you know rabbi I don't think you know what you're talking about what's that not a big deal took him what six seven words hey rabbi I don't think you know what you're talking about he left it on YouTube he left it on Facebook he left it on WhatsApp wherever it is other people see it not one-on-one -on -one. now he's asking a question not asking a question he's just making a comment oh this guy's a fool oh this guy's this oh he comes to the lecture just to uh embarrass the the, the rabbi in public that Kabbalah says that's an apicos so there's a question here wait a minute on one hand you told me somebody that violates the entire Torah by saying that there's no God or there's an intermediary or there's a all types of specific things that violate the entire Torah but then I ask you what's give me an example of apicos you could have told me a Christian you could have told me a uh, you know a Buddhist you could have told me somebody that worships dogs I don't know you could have told me a lot of other things why did you pick this why did you pick somebody that decides to go make fun of a rabbi somebody that decides to go make fun and, and and go and insult a Talmud Chacham. Why? Like, why is that the example? So Chachamim answered geniusly. Say, if he has no respect for the Talmud Chacham, for sure he's violating the entire Torah. If he does not have honor for the Talmud Chachamim, for sure he's violating also the rest of the Torah. Because that same Torah says someone. That, this, uh, that embarrasses a Talmud Chacham and Trufa Makato. There is no cure to his disease. Hashem gives him a disease. Hashem gives him a punishment. There's no cure. So if he says he knows Torah but still decided to go make fun of a righteous person, that learns Torah, that teaches Torah, he still decided to do it, that means this guy doesn't know anything. That means he's violating the entire Torah because if he would have known at least half of what he thinks he knows, he would have read in the Torah, you go embarrass another Talmud Chacham, you go embarrass another rabbi that's actually a decent human being. You may disagree with him, but you, you actually embarrass him, you make funny comments about him to make people laugh, you make jokes about him, you encourage people not to watch the shiurim, you encourage people not to come to the shiur, and so on. Oh, wow. You, you missed the big part of the Torah. Torah says, you, the punishment, when you finally get it, Hashem Yachem, there's no cure to it. There was a story published in Israel some time ago. A religious guy wrote about himself translated to English for anyone that wants to see it I'll send it to you and the story is very detailed and very sad too but it teaches a lot of Musa the guy tells about himself he says I kept Torah and mitzvot I learned everything was going good wife couple of kids life couldn't be better one day his three or four year old kid 
I believe it was his firstborn. He sees there's something wrong about his kid. He doesn't feel good. He says, my son, he was my life. He was my life. He said, I live vicariously to my son. A lot of parents are like that. I don't blame them. But I saw my son, three, four-year-old little kid. I saw him, and I saw there's something wrong with him. Something is not good. I put my hand on his forehead. He was burning. I took him to the hospital in Eretz Yisrael, thinking, yes, fever, something, but it's going to be okay. Short while later, the doctors come out. Their faces look like they saw a ghost. When they tell me the news, they're about to cry themselves. And they tell me, we're sorry. Your son has a virus we can't cure. He has moments. I said, what? He was okay a few hours ago. What are you talking about? They didn't know what to tell me. Kid died. Genera. He says, that death of my three-year-old kid, my whole world collapsed. I couldn't stop crying. The Shiva, everyone was crying. Everyone's looking at me. Everyone's, it was just a horrible, awful, miserable day. Another day. And it just seems like it's never going to end. By the time the Shiva is over, a week is over, I look at my second son, and he doesn't look good. I take my son, Shiva is just over a few hours ago. I take my son to the hospital. The same doctors come out with the same look on their face. And I say, what? He says, it's the same virus. So what do you mean? I just buried my other son. We can't cure it. We don't know what to do. But at least this one's earlier. We're going to try. We have more chance. But we don't know. I start crying. I don't know what to do. I'm in the hospital. I just lost my son. I just finished the Shiva. Hashem Yachem. I have my second son. I don't know if he's going to live the day, not going to live the day. I don't know what to do. I'm crying. I don't know what to do. And one of the nurses, who was a religious woman, sees me and she starts yelling at me. She says, it's not too late. I look at her and I'm like, what? What too late? It's not too late. Go talk to Hashem. I don't know why I didn't think about it. But apparently that's what I needed to do. I realized she made sense. I left the place. I went to the Kotel. I started praying over there. And I didn't stop. And I was crying. And people saw me crying. And they started crying. And they would ask questions. And eventually everybody knew. And it was hundreds of people were crying hysterical. To get Rachamim from Shemaim. After a whole day of this, I came back to the hospital and the doctors tell me he's stable, but we don't know. I continued to cry at the hospital until I fell asleep on my chair. Now, I don't have dreams, he says, but after I fell asleep in the hospital, I had a dream and I saw my rabbi who died a few years ago. He was a very righteous man. And I said, Rabbi, please, please help me, Rabbi. And then I see my son is next to him, the one that just, I just buried. And then I see my other son is next to him. I said, no, no, Rabbi, don't take him. Please, please help me. And he didn't want to talk to me. The Rabbi didn't want to talk to me. I said, no, Rabbi, it's me. It's me, please help me. And the Rabbi didn't want to talk to me. I said, please, my son, oh, please help me. It's my son. Rabbi, please, it's my son. I want, a, I want one son. He says, how come you didn't do tshuva? I says, why? What are you talking? What did I do? He says to me, someone that embarrasses a Talmit Chacham and trufa le makato. Someone that embarrasses a Talmit Chacham, there's no cure. In the moment he said it, and he was not happy with me, I realized I embarrassed Talmit Chacham. I realized 
I didn't think it was such a big deal to just say to the rabbi, you know, be quiet for a second. I want to say something. That's it. He didn't write uh, journals. He wrote a little comment on the internet. No, it's, uh, he didn't have a whole website. Just a comment. Be quiet for a second. I want to say something. That's it. I realized it and I started doing tshuva for it and within hours the doctors came out and told me my son is okay. Now he writes in a story, you may believe this and start doing tshuva. You may ignore it completely because you don't think that you did the same thing I did a million times. You may not believe it and say, oh, this guy, yeah, it's just rabbis wrote the story just to scare people. You're at your own risk. A Torah says it one way or another. Now, a person has to look at himself in a mirror every day. And he has to answer questions. Why does he have the job that he has? Why is his marriage the way it is? Why is his Torah what it is? He has to answer, because I mean, at some point, he has to do nefesh, has to do accounting every day. Now, the next time he looks at his kids, he says, oh, I love them. But then right after that, he's going to go on Facebook and want to write a comment. Or he's going to want to go and disrespect his local rabbi and his keilah. Or he's going to want to do certain things that Torah says no. At that moment, at that moment that he's about to do something that he's not supposed to do, at that moment he's going to look at a girl that's not his wife. At that moment he's about to steal money that doesn't belong to him. At that moment, he's going to charge a Jew interest. At that moment, he's going to drive on Shabbat. At that moment, he's going to embarrass the Talmud Chacham. At that moment, he's going to go against the Shem one way or the other. At that moment, that's when he has to think of this story and immediately think of his kids. You told them you love them. The least you can do is keep them alive. You love them, don't kill them. Ah, you're just scaring people. Okay, it's your risk. Kabbalah says it countless times. A person that does not believe such a Gemara, a person that doesn't believe our sages that say, by simply embarrassing somebody that teaches Torah, by simply insulting a person that teaches Torah, a person that knows Torah, you become classified as an apicolus in heaven, makes him an apicolus. But then the Chachamim go further. And they say, by the way, it's not just a Tamit Chacham. Even if you embarrass somebody next to the Tamit Chacham. The rabbi says, anybody have a question? And one guy says, yeah, yeah, I have, I have this question. And everybody looks at him and like, stupid question. Or everybody says, anybody have the answer? And the guy says the answer, and it's wrong. It's like, ah, what a dumb answer you have. You make the guy feel like he's a quarter. You make the guy feel like he's a nothing, right? Says that guy that embarrassed the other guy, aside from aside from the fact that once you embarrass a person in public, you have no share of the world to come. But now you've added another classification to yourself. You embarrassed another person in front of the Tamil Chacham, in front of the rabbi. You become an apikos also. Why? Because by embarrassing another person in front of the Tamil Chacham, in essence, you're embarrassing the Tamil Chacham. You're embarrassing the Torah that he has. As if he never told you it's not allowed to do what you're doing. Yeah, but it was a stupid answer. It's not for you to say. It's not for you to say. Yeah, it was a dumb question. It's not for you to say. It's not for you to say. So... These boundaries that seem really, really scary, at the end of it all, when you really think about it, just teach you how to be a decent human being. Don't make fun of people. Don't embarrass people for no reason. Don't go against the Shem. Yes, the punishment is severe, but not to do it is not that difficult until you become addicted to it. And that's the next part that we have to look at. The Mishnah here, Chachamim say, a very interesting question. 
says that the Mishnah here mentions all types of things. Someone who doesn't believe in the old Torah, someone who doesn't believe in the resurrection of the dead, someone goes against Hashem in such ways. Then it says, someone who reads external books. Some say that external books is like, for example, like the New Testament, or things that are have heretical um, commentary on our Torah that's not uh, that has no uh, not not from the Torah itself. Like for example, a lot of people like to read these books, and I remember myself. We used to have some of these books in our house. The story of King David, the story of uh, whatever Jacob, the story of whatever somebody in our Torah, but written by some professor. Written by some uh, Christian author. This is Chitonim. Why? Because even if those stories have truth in it, they have from the Torah. King David was young, had red hair, this, he killed Goliath, all that stuff is good. But then they add their heresy into it. They, had, they add their own opinion to it. They add stuff that's not from our sages. That's called Chitonim. Those books, people that read those on a regular basis can lose their olamba. Why? If they read those books and take them seriously, meaning they're going to follow what the book says, of course they're going to violate the entire Torah. But if they read the book in order to teach people what not to read, say, oh yeah, I went over the entire New Testament. Not, that's all, not, not because I believe in the New Testament, but to teach you all the mistakes in it. Like Rav Tobias Singer, God bless him. He has had another fantastic debate in Australia. Destroyed Christianity all over again. It's every time it's a new destruction. I don't even know why anybody even dares to debate him. It's like committing suicide and expecting to live. It's crazy. Destroys them completely. It's a joke. I don't think anybody, any rabbi, any Jew should ever allow themselves to debate. Just say, you want to debate? Go debate Rabbi Toby Singer. What? It's a guaranteed win. He knows their books better than them. When he read it, wait, he read it to believe it? No, he read it with a goal, with a purpose, to show you all of the mistakes, countless mistakes, that you're allowed to do. But if you're going to read it to go learn what this Christian professor said, or what this uh, theologian said, or what this psychiatrist said with a side gig of as an author, what does she say about King David and Jacob and this one and that one, then you have yourself a serious problem. Now, how now you think this problem is like, oh, okay, so don't read the New Testament. That's enough, right? No, no. Rabotai, right now, for some reason, I don't know what happened, but apparently, I think it's an epidemic only in a few places. I hope. I don't know. I hope. But I know at least a couple of Sephardi shuls. One happens to be Manchester again. And the other one actually is in here, Florida. It's probably another place. I just don't know. But these so-called shuls, synagogues, Decided to start something called a book club. Now, if you see the list of the books they read, they're not reading Perkebot. They're not reading the Deir uh, Hashem. They're not reading Mesilat Yesharim. They're not reading Tanakh. What do they read? Chitzonim. They read the books you're not allowed to read. And they publicize it. Anyone that wants to come to Miss Sylvia's house on Tuesdays at 7 o'clock, we are reading King David by Jesus, by whatever, by whoever. I say to myself, God, this is a shul program. This Dweck Rasha from, from London, he started a book club. The first book on the book club, you're not even allowed to think about. It's not about you not to read it. You're not allowed to think about it. Toyevat Hashem talks about all of the garbage of the world. Homosexuality and all types of garbage. That's the first book in the book club recommended by the rabbi. It's like if this was a joke, it wouldn't even be funny. But this is what's happening today. Why? No one read this Gemara. This Gemara says, you read those books, you read books like this, for sure you have no share of the world to come. That's what it says. Not your own word. That's what it says. But some have an opinion. Some rabbis, some sages have, say an opinion. By the way, it also includes secular books. 
You like to read Harry Potter? Some sages, Alvai will become the dust under their feet. Some sages have the opinion to include secular books. Now, that's not the halacha. But me, I wouldn't even take the risk. Why? First and foremost, who am I to go and disagree with the giant sage? That's number one. Number two, our Torah is so enormous. Who has time to read anything else? Now, of course, if you're in a bathroom or something and you're in, a, I don't know, an extra 20 minutes in a bathroom, a half hour in a bathroom, you have a bad stomach and you are, you're bored out of your mind, you want to read a Harry Potter book or, or the New Testament, same thing, enjoy. That's 20 minutes. You can't read Torah in there. Go. That's where I'm right now I'm currently reading my Zionism book. 51 letters. 51 letters about Zionism. You guys, once I finish this book, oh, God bless you. You're going to have a wonderful, wonderful shiur. They're shayim arurim, what these people did. But anyway, you want to read in the bathroom? No problem. But when it's your Torah time? No problem. You can lose a lot about that way. Also says people that use incantations or people that say the name of Hashem. You can't just use your Hashem's name like it's uh, you're saying uh, Mikey and Steve and Joe. You have to be ve very, very careful with Hashem's name. Apparently today it's become very, very um, just confused apparently, like everything else, where people say or type Hashem's name with the Y. Or they say that name, especially Goyim or people that are in the process of conversion or sometimes Jews that are Baalei Tshuva are saying the name and they try to pronounce it and they say the name with the Y. You have a very serious problem. You shouldn't even have the Yud K Vav K in anywhere other than your Sefer Torah or in your, uh, uh, or in your Sidu. Don't make posters with the Yud K Vav K on it. It's not Mikey. It's not Joe. You can't just put Hashem's name any, any way you feel like it. Like some people make paintings of it. Don't. You're playing with fire. It belongs at certain places. It belongs under certain conditions. Don't have it as your screensaver. It's not Joe. It's not Steve. Again, it's not your name. You want to write your name and put it on your screensaver? Enjoy. You want to put my name on there? You can do that too, fine. Put a heart sign next to my name. I love you too. But don't put a chef's name on it. Why? It's not, he's not your friend. You can't just use his name. So, misusing a chef's name, even saying his name inappropriately by saying a pasuk in a Torah, saying, a chef is the healer of all wounds. After you got, and you think, oh, this is going to cure it or something. Using that name inappropriately also is dangerous. So, point I'm trying to tell you here is that this is a very deep part, but don't just use Hashem's name for no reason. Two reasons to use it, are allowed perfectly fine to use it, when you're praying, when you're reading Torah. In fact, if you're reading a verse from a Torah and you don't say Hashem's name, some say that it's actually a desecration of Hashem's name. So in essence, when you're reading a pasuk from the Torah, you should say his name. But if you are just talking to people or talking to yourself, don't just say Hashem's name. Now, the last part is the question that the sages ask. The Mishnah here lists all types of sin that cause a person to lose their share in the world to come. And we know that losing a share of the world to come is not exactly uh, a joke. Simply said, what does it mean to lose a share of the world to come? It means eternal suffering. You want details? Shiur called Yaron Ruven, Pirkei Avot, I think that's what it's called, something like that. You'll get the details over there, at least part of them. Sh losing a share of the world to come, it doesn't mean you just disappear into nothing. It doesn't mean that. There's eternal reward, which means eternal bliss, greatness, amazing, which the Gemara goes into that also. 
Losing, exact opposite. So the Mishnah here says, wait a minute. It's saying a few sins here that a person loses their share of the world to come, but there are other Gemarot, there are other Mishnayot, there are other Sfarim that say other sins and you lose a share of the world to come. Gemara Maseret Rosh Hashanah, page 17a, Gemara Maseret Sota, page 5a, Ketubot, 110b, also in Maseret Avot, uh, chapter 3, Mishnah number 11, says, Amitkabel beklon chavero, en lo chelek lo anaba, someone that takes pride in his friend's loss, you see somebody losing and that makes you happy, also lose share of the world to come. You go to Avot Rabbi Natan, 36, or the famous Rambam in Chotshuva, goes into categories. In chapter 3, Halakha number 6 to 14, enumerates 24 different categories of who loses their share of the world to come. So how come over here it only says about a half a dozen? And over here, all the other places, the Rambam lists a bunch of them. So the traditional opinion is, traditional answer is, that all of those others are under Apikos. All of the other ones. All of the other possibilities are under Apikos. That's a person that's simply, you do that, you go with a married woman, have no share of the world to come. You lend another Jew money, charge him interest, no share of the world to come. And so on and so forth. All of that is on the, on the apikos. But Rav Elchanan Wasalam and Allah Shalom gives a very interesting explanation. Another uh, pshat. He says, in Perik Chelek, in here, he says that the Mishnah appears that there's uh, different penalties for various sins, but it lists only those who lo- lose their share of the world to come as a punishment for their sin. Why? He says because here, versus all of the other places in the Gemara, the other ones... For example, Lashon Ara. It's only if you made Lashon Ara habitual. You said Lashon Ara one time, you're not going to lose a lot about it. It's a terrible, terrible, horrible thing. You're not losing a lot about it. You violate all the other ones that I've mentioned in the previous shiurim. We're not going to go over again. You violate one of those, you're not losing a lot about it. It's terrible. When do you lose a lot about when you do those things? When you make it habitual. When you are of Michal Shabbat regularly. When you shave with a knife, regularly. These, you only write it once and you're finished. If you don't do tshuva. That's what Rabbi Hanan wants. He says, these handful, they're so terrible that all you have to do is violate them one time. Imagine, you said one word, Lashon Ara, Finished. In Shammai, you said, X. I mean, you you worked seven years to be righteous, 70 years to do good, seven years of Shabbat, seven years of Kashrut, seven years of cleaning for Pesach, seven years of Tzedakah, seven years of everything, but you said something about the rabbi one time. That's how horrible these sins are. So the Rav Wasserman says, in essence, this is the danger of these specific sins. Now, the few people that it's mentioned here as examples are mentioned for a reason. It says, look at who's mentioned here. Three kings and four commoners. Who are these people? First it says, Yeravam. Yerobam was an enormous Talmud Chacham. The Gemara says he knew 107, 127 commentaries on any part of the Torah. It's meant, we had other Rashaim in Israel. But it's telling you specifically Yerobam. Why? 
Yeruvam was a Tamid Chacham. What was his problem? Jealousy. A little bit of jealousy. He didn't want his people to go to the Bet HaMikdash. Why? If they go to the Bet HaMikdash, maybe they're going to go to the other kingdom. Because there was a debate between the two kingdoms. So how do I convince them not to go? Ah, I'm going to put two golden calves. In essence, turned his entire people into idol worshippers. But he had so much Torah, he had so much Torah that he had merit to such an extent that a Kadosh Baruch Hu came to him. He says, Yerobam, do tshuva, and you, and you, and I, and, and uh, Ben Yishai, meaning David HaMelech, will all walk together in Gan Eden. If Hashem came to me and said, Yaron, do tshuva, me, you, and David HaMelech, me, you, and uh, Bezalel, me, you, and anybody else in the world, doesn't make a difference. I'm going to work in Gan Eden, guess what I'm doing? I'm doing tshuva, finally. Yehovah, apparently, that wasn't enough. Hashem says to him, do tshuva, you and I, and Ben Ishai, we're going to go, be Gan Eden together. What does Yehovah say? Yehovah says, and who's going to walk first? Who's the first in line? Me or Ben Ishai? Now technically, if you pay attention to what Hashem says, what did Hashem say? You and I and Ben Ishai, which means Yerovam was going to be in the head. But Yerovam was one of those people, he liked to hear the kavod a little bit much. He liked to hear it. You know, it's like one of those people that says to you, wow, it's a really good cake. What would you say? What would you say? Oh, what would you say? Tell me again. What? Wow, you, you had a good shoe. What? What? What do you say? Good what? Good what? Oh, shoe. Oh, it's a good shoe. Oh, thanks. Thanks. See, guys? Good good shoe. Why? Wow, you look good. Why? I look what? Huh? You want to hear it again? Why? You like kavod. You like kavod, you lose merit. So when Hashem responds to him, when he says, Hashem, which one is first? You already said which one's first. Hashem says, David's first. Why? You are first. You're chasing Kavod. You're not first anymore. You're second. We're still going to be in Gan Eden. Who here is promised Gan Eden? Raise your hand. I'm not raising my hand. I don't know. I wish. Somebody, Hashem gives you guarantee you're Gan Eden. Yerovam was such an arrogant person. As soon as he saw, what? I'm not first? I'm not going. I'm not going. If I'm not going to Gan Eden first, I'm not going. This is how idiotic arrogance can get you to. This is how horrible it can get you. This is, this is a person that chases kavod. There's no cure other than complete shame and embarrassment. Why? Because a person that chases kavod, there's never going to be enough. She's always going to want more compliments. He's always going to want more credit. There, it's never going to be enough. You can tell them, I'm making a new billboard with your face on it to say, thank you, so-and-so. Oh, that's it? Just, just one billboard? <laughs> that's it? That's what I'm worth to you? <coughs> one billboard? <laughs> don't do it. Don't, be fair. Don't, don't do it. Don't do it, okay? Don't do the billboard. I don't want a billboard anymore. I, I, I was going to give you a crowd. I was going to put you on the website. Say, thank you, Mr. Smith, for donating $20. The billboard costs 20000 but I'm putting it, say thank you. No, what, just one billboard? That's what I'm worth to you. That's it? That's all I am? What disrespect? Why are you disrespecting me like that? What? You should have better said there's nothing. This is what a person chases kavod. A person that chases kavod, chases honor, there's no, no end. Even if they know Torah. Why? Because the Gemara says a person that chases kavod... His Torah, lo bashamayni. His Torah is not from heaven. Then we move on to Achav. Achav was married to a woman named Izevel. Izevel, if you break up the word, also means she's garbage. But interestingly enough, in English, Izevel is Isabel. Very common name, pretty name. 
But Izevel was a very, very wicked woman. She saw that her husband, Achav, he has an eye on a field. But the field's not his. He tried buying it. The prophet's not selling it. Not selling it. So she says, listen, why is the king so upset? Let me take care of it. She made up some charges, told everybody that this person, this righteous person, this tzaddik, is going against the malchut, death penalty, and took his land. That's how they ran their kingdom. And that's how these two reshaim that had the power to do a lot of good turned the entire nation into Ovde Avodazara. All of them became the worst type of Avodazara. What Avodazara? Baal. They went everybody to make them go worship the Baal. This Avodazara, I mean, if you learn about it, it's most disgusting. Aside from what I just told you, you know what's the other thing they do? Take their little kids and burn them. Crazy. This is what these people did. Why? How did it all start? A little bit of jealousy. A little bit of jealousy. That's it. That's all it was. A little bit of jealousy. Finished. Then you have Menashe. Menashe, as we talked about already, made fun of the Torah, surely but, slowly but surely became a idol worshiper. 22 years on the throne, spreading idolatry. But then Rabbi Uda says, wait a minute, hold on a second, he did tshuva. So Hamim says, yeah, he did tshuva, but we're not 100% sure Hashem forgave him. What do you mean? He's, it says in a verse over here. It says, yeah, he returned him to kinghood. We're not 100% sure he forgave him. It's like, wait a minute. It was 33 years. Chuba. He violated Hashem's name and did Abu Dazara and so on for 22 years. But his Chuba was 33 years. So that's not enough. So some of the sages say it's still questionable. Why it's questionable? Because he's a Mahtiya Rabin. You cause other people to sin. It's not so easy to do tshuva for such a thing. It's not so easy. That's why there's still some that actually have a question. Why? It's a different class of sin once you make other people sin. You're in a different league. It's not so simple. The end conclusion is that he does have a share of the world to come. But the point is that it's still questioned. Imagine, you did tshuva for 30 years. You're about tshuva 30 years already. You should be considered from as from. That's it, you're fine. No. I say, no, yeah, 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 you're supreme. We're not really sure about you if you keep Shabbat. What? You keep Shabbat 30 years. I teach Torah. What do you want for my life? Yeah, you keep Torah. I'm sad about it. Sad about it. Your own way. Your own way. What? I'm Jewish. What are you talking about? Yeah, yeah, you're Jewish. Yeah, yeah. No, you call that. You call that Jewish. Yeah, I'm sorry. Why? In your old days, you owned a club. In your old days, you did stuff that caused other people to sin. It wasn't just you sinning by yourself, driving on Shabbat. You, caught, you had a business that caused other people to sin. That's the problem. That's the problem. Then it gives a few examples of commoners. Bilam is the first commoner, even though there was a lot of wicked people in history, why does it mention Bilam? For two reasons, the Gemara says. One reason is because people think that anybody that talks to God is automatically righteous. This is one example where, obviously, you see it's not. He was a wicked, wicked person, as wicked as can be. He married his donkey and committed bestiality, but yet Hashem still spoke to him. The Chamim say, how is it possible that he still spoke to him if he's full of Tum'ah? He says that, it says that Bilam only had one eye. The other part, the other part where his eye would be was just a hole. So he says that hole was the only part of his body that didn't sin. So when Hashem would give him prophecy, it would be through that hole. The rest of him was tameh. The rest of him was impure. But it's to show you that even someone that speaks to God doesn't necessarily mean they're righteous automatically. They can still go to Gehenom forever. The other thing is, is also to teach us that non-Jews also have a share of the world to come. 
Because if Bil'am doesn't have a share of the world to come, by default, what does that mean? That means that if he was righteous, or any uh, Noahide that's righteous, has a share of the world to come. From there we learn that's the source. Doeg and Achitofel were both Talmidei Chachamim. But they were jealous of David. They were jealous of things they weren't supposed to be. They went against Torah. They violated Hashem's name. They said Lashon Hara. But the Chachamim say, wait a minute. How is it possible that these people said Lashon Hara? They were jealous. They did stuff. What? They knew a lot of Torah. They had a question. They had 400 questions no one can answer about Allah. That's how smart they were. 400 questions no one can answer about a certain tower that's in midair. That's what says. There's a certain tower, a certain building. It's in midair. A lot of questions about it. 400 questions they came up with. No one can figure it out. And then it was a question about where is the Bet Mikdash supposed to be? No one can answer it but them. They didn't want to answer it. Eventually, David the Middle figured it out. But the point is that they had, they had. Huge Torah says they have no share of the world to come. No share of the world to come. So you see here, Abutai, that people much, much bigger than you can imagine lost their share of the world to come very, very easily. How so? Almost finished, I promise. The introduction. Hey, listen, this is The Rambam has a section in Ilchot Shuvah that I believe every one of you should read. You should spend some time to read it. It won't take you very long. I'm not going to read all of it. I'm going to read small little highlighted parts that I highlighted. But he gives us a lot of answers. The whole chapter 9 of Ilchot Shuvah, it's, in essence, explains this entire shiur. He says that Torah obviously has reward and punishment. Nevertheless, the benefits are not the ultimate reward for the mitzvot, nor is the evil that a person gets in this world the, to be exact from someone who transgresses all mitzvot. Meaning that the reward and punishment, this is the first halakha, reward and punishment in this world is not the ultimate reward or the ultimate punishment. Now, at the end of the first halakha, he says, those who abandon the Torah are considered the, the, the rebels against the Torah. He says that he will bring upon them all the evils which prevent them from acquiring portions of the world to come, so that they will be destroyed in their wickedness. In essence, in the first halakha, he explains that the only way that a person could acquire a share in the world to come is through Torah and mitzvot. So, since a punishment, a reward for a mitzvah is another mitzvah, and a punishment for a sin is another sin, in essence, what ends up happening is that when a person sins, Hashem punishes him with his desire to make another sin. Now, aside from the fact that the sin is something that's going to inherit him another punishment, worse than that is that it removes his ability to do a mitzvah which is his only way to acquire Olam Abba. Meaning that the person that sins continues to sin, and eventually, even after he dies, it's like he has, oh, so where do I go now? It's like, well, you don't have any mitzvot. You don't have anything to get to Olam Abba. You have no ticket. Yeah, but I did a few mitzvot. Yeah, but those mitzvot, we paid you for them already. Look how many sins you have. And he uses the verse in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 47, 48. It says, because you did not serve God, your Lord, with happiness, you will serve your enemies whom God sends against you. Now, how does this all start? He says, in the end of uh, the uh, first al he says, if you've abandoned God and become obsessed with food, drink, lewdness, and the like, meaning you've become obsessed with desires, fulfilling your desires, your materialistic desires, your human physicality. He will bring all of these curses upon you and remove all the blessings until you will conclude all your days in confusion and fear. 
You will not have a free heart or a complete body to fulfill the mitzvot in order that you forfeit the life of the world to come. Thus you will forfeit two worlds. For when a person is occupied in this world with sickness, war, hunger, he cannot involve himself with either wisdom or mitzvot which allow him to merit the life of the world to come. So he tells you that because you didn't serve the right, Hashem the right way, instead you used that opportunity to serve yourself. Every time you were hungry, you ate. Every time you weren't hungry, you ate. Every time you were, uh, had a desire, you fulfilled it. Every time you didn't have it, you fulfilled it. Why? Because in the beginning, the Gemara says in Maseret Sanhedrin, says in the beginning, a sin is like a uh, spider web. But after, it becomes like a uh, rope. A rope like you use for a ship. What's the lesson? It says, in the beginning, before you made the first sin, to overcome that obstacle, it's very easy. It's like taking your finger and you break the cobweb. If you didn't perform the sin the first time, and you have a desire, this girl, this guy, this money, this whatever it is, you have a certain desire, but you didn't make the sin first, it's very easy to overcome it. Because you didn't do it yet. Once you do it, once you fall for the trap, now all of a sudden you're starting to see, wait, did I get punished? No. I didn't get punished. So what do you do? You do it again. After you do it twice, and you don't get punished, now what's the problem? It becomes as if it's permissible in your eyes. Oh, Hashem didn't punish me for it, so this rabbi was lying. I'm really allowed to look at whatever woman I want. I'm really allowed to, dist- I'm really allowed to do with all the things. It becomes permissible in your eyes. And now Hashem allows you to sin even more as a punishment for your sin. Until you eventually realize, oh man, what did I get myself into? My whole life is in the, is in the gutters. My, the wife left them, the husband left her, the kids, the this, and the whole. Now the sin, their disastrous life of fulfilling their desires ended up ruining everything in this world. But now they realize, okay, can I do something? Yes, you can. But it's no longer a cobweb anymore. Now it's a rope. Meaning it's much more difficult to get rid of the sin. Why? You're addicted to it. You're addicted to the sin. You're addicted to eating cheeseburgers. You're addicted to looking at girls. You're addicted to uh, gambling. You're addicted to the stuff. So it's much harder to overcome. It's possible, but it's not as easy as it was in the beginning. Hence the reason of why Yirat Shamayim is so critical. Because if a person has Yirat Shamayim, if he has fear of Hashem, he simply puts the boundaries around himself and asks himself 500 times before he takes any step. So the Rambam continues and says, for these reasons, all of Israel, in particular their prophets and their sages, have yearned for the Messianic age so that they can rest from these oppressions of the uh, Gentile kingdoms who do not allow them to occupy themselves with Torah and Mitzvot properly. And he talks about how there's going to be an abundance of Torah knowledge and he uses different verses from the Torah, from Ezekiel, from uh, Isaiah, from uh, Psalms, different places in the Torah talks about this uh, messianic age. This extraordinary time where all of Israel have a share of the world to come. But that's assuming you're still part of Am Yisrael. So you see, Rabotai, Hashem did create a world. Just like Rabbi Hanina says, to glorify His name. At the same time, he also wanted to give you merit, meaning give you an opportunity to serve him to the max, maximum level, to the best way possible. And that's why he gave you a lot of Torah and mitzvot. But at the same token, those same Torah and mitzvot are protecting you from you. That's the boundaries. That's the limits. That's the uh, different gates that's going to keep you as part of Am Yisrael as part of his chosen people 
that's supposed to serve him. Because once a person violates things that superficially seem simple, they're no longer classified as Am Yisrael. It's very, very easy to lose Olam Abba. But it's also very, very easy to gain it. Because we have Tshuva. The key is to be honest with ourselves. And not be like the Pasuk says, In their mouth, in their uh, hearts, they honored me, but, uh, no, in their mouth, in their lips, they honored me, but in their hearts, they uh, were far away from me. Meaning that a lot of people say, Be'ezrat Hashem, Baruch Hashem, and pray, and learn, and do a lot of different things, but still do simple things, like we talked about today, that the Torah says you lose a while back. So the key is to stay away from those things. Key is to double check yourself. Key is to constantly give yourself a self accounting of where you stand. And Bezad Hashem, Hashem will have mercy on us to finally give us real Yirat Shemaim, to finally give us what we really want. But sometimes it's impossible for us to attain without a special miracle from Him. Which means that the only way that we can really get it is if we work on it. Meaning that, yes, you want the Torah. Hashem wants to give it to you. You have to earn it. How? That's what the mitzvot are for. You perform the mitzvot to the best of your ability. You perform the mitzvot as if they're the only thing that you care about. You learn his Torah with mesirut nefesh, with sacrifice. You sacrifice everything and anything for the honor of Hashem. You constantly go and look to help his kids do tshuva. You constantly go and help your family get closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu without yelling and screaming at everybody. You constantly do everything impossible to sanctify Hashem's name and His uh, soldiers and His uh, children. You constantly do things like that and you stand for the truth. Hashem will give you all of that. Meaning, will give you the ability to have really Yerat Shemaim. will give you the ability to know a lot of Torah. will give you the ability to perform a lot of mitzvot. will give you the ability to have a good life here. And needless to say, in eternity also. But the point is, is that there's no Torah without Mesirut Nefesh. This is one of the main things that I think myself, I learned from this series. 177 lectures, over 500 hours, and Bezat Hashem, hopefully we at least apply that one thing in our life. Without Mesirut Nefesh, there's no Torah. With Mesirut Nefesh, you have eternity. Any questions? Pray for Kavod? Where do we pray for Kavod? Oh, we pray for Anna? Anna for Hashem, maybe. Not Anna for us. Anna for the Torah, maybe. Not Anna for us. Ah, uh, no, no, not for us. Definitely not for you. Anything else? With regards to the Kavod, the Shlakish in Maskei Mugra that has um, six, it says that the Wasak was born of Paul Kavod, and then when he saw him, he went to give him Kavod, so he took the rabbi and put him on the shelf to cross him and give him the water. And he, and, and he asked the guy, why would you want to carry the son of Lakish? somebody has to serve his rabbi yeah. and also if somebody is to delegate somebody else he himself at least should teach the person something or, or must have learned together something with the person right so there's a, an issue of kavod here so to speak so the it's a just like it's a mitzvah to give a talmit chacham kavod it's a mitzvah for the Talmud Chacham to allow you to give him kavod. Why? Because you're not giving him the kavod. 
You're giving the Torah in him the kavod. If he has no Torah, he's worthless. You wouldn't give him the kavod, or you shouldn't. You're technically not allowed to give a kavod to somebody who doesn't have Torah. But if he has Torah, if he has Torah, then you're giving the Torah in him as a uh, as a kavod. In essence, he is a living Sefer Torah. When he walks into the room, you have to stand up. Just like, for example, you have a parochet here. You open a parochet, you have Sifret Torah behind it. If we take the Sefer Torah out of it, everybody has to, ch- everybody has to stand up. Why? Because Sefer Torah, you have to give it kavod. Someone that's a living Sefer Torah is more than the Sefer Torah over here. More than the Sefer Torah here. Why? Because he's Tamir Haram. He's a living Sefer Torah. But he has to allow you to give him kavod. Why does he have to allow you to give kavod? Not that he wants the kavod. He has to allow you to perform the mitzvah of giving the Torah kavod. So for example, sometimes I learned this from my rabbi. I can't stand it, but I have to do it. Um, there's certain things that I feel uncomfortable. I don't like compliments. I feel uncomfortable when people compliment me. I don't know why. It's always been that way. On one end, you want people to give you a good review. On another end, it makes you feel uncomfortable. It's very strange. Probably some type of psychological experiment or something. Anyway, so I find it strange. But sometimes, you know, it, it happens. Somebody has to thank me at some point and, uh, for something good that I did at some point. And, um, you know, if we give uh, money to some poor people in Eretz Israel, these Abrechim, you know, these people are not like uh, you and me. They actually know how to say thank you. So they want to call me and say thank you. And, you know, Rabbi Fryer tells me, oh, no, such and such wants to, wants to talk to you right now. He wants to thank you. I said, no, no, tell him to thank you. Because no, he wants to thank you. I said, no, don't thank me. Thank you, it's fine. It's okay, he doesn't have to thank me. I got it. It's fine, I got it. Because, no, no, you have to let them thank you. Why? That is a bigger part of their joy than what they got. A person, he needs something. He needs something. And if he's a good person, I'm talking about, I'm talking about, I'm talking about somebody, certain people are leeches. All they want, they want, they want, they want, they want, even if they don't need, they want. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about regular good people, which exist somewhere in the world. Now, people like that, their joy is bigger. The thank you is bigger than what you gave them. You helped them out. You gave them, uh, I don't know, $1,000 to help them for the hug. That's going to help them. They have a hug now. They have the, it's good, it's great. But to go and tell you thank you for being the shliach, for being the messenger of Hashem that actually did it, that for them is even greater. Because they're good people. So you have to allow them to say thank you. You have to allow them to say thank you. Meaning that it's not that you want to thank you. If you're looking for the thank you, then there's uh, obviously there's a mitzvah. Is, uh, you know, it's it's, pgumah, it's it's defective, this mitzvah. It's a defective mitzvah. You're giving people money or you're giving people something for, 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 for something in return. There's a problem here. But if you're doing it 100% because you want to do good, you have to allow them to say thank you. If they want to say thank you, you have to allow them to say thank you. Why? Because it's actually completing your mitzvah. It's part of their happiness is to say thank you. So most people like people say thank you. Actually, if you don't say thank you to them, they start hating you. But uh, some people feel weird. Um, just it is what it is. So that's, that's it. So as far as the Talmud uh, Chacham, like for example, you're going to see, especially in the Sephardi world, it's customary to kiss the hand of the rabbi, the Sephardi rabbis. In the Ashkenazi world, it's not, it's not, it's not common, um, unless it's Hasidim. Hasidim uh, treat their rabbis very, very differently. They're, they love their rabbis, uh, in some cases a little bit too much. But, uh, you know, the Hasidim that are real tzaddikim, they love their rabbis. They have this, uh, you know, events every week where they go to the tish, and the rabbi eats a little bit of food, and but they, the rest of the people jump on the plate. It's not because they're hungry. It's not because they're hungry. It's not because of that. It's because they love their rabbi, the Torah that he has, the kedusha that he has so much. They just want to touch anything he touched. It's like, for example, you have a sefer Torah here. Imagine you could have one letter in the Torah. How valuable is that? You have one letter in the Torah, Ishtabach Shima. I remember when we wrote the Sefer Torah, and they brought the Torah to, uh, to New York, and the, uh, the last few letters we were able to write, because they can't ship it while it's, still, while it's complete. You have to uh, have a few letters missing, or else you have to have uh, a minyan of people carry it at all times. 
But if there's a few letters missing, then it's not considered a Sefer Torah. You can even throw it in luggage if you want. Anyway, when, uh, when the rabbi came and brought it here, and we had to complete the Sefer Torah, they wrote a few letters. I was in one of them. It's, it was amazing. Why? Because like, you feel like you're part of this Torah. Yeah, there's 300, 4,000, 805 letters, and technically you only like held his hand to write one. But still, it's your letter. You feel like there's a connection here. So now, this is it. The people that love their Rebbe's, they love them and they want a piece of bread or they want a whatever, a piece of fruit or whatever it is that they have from the Rebbe. Not because of food, because they want the Rabbi. They want a piece of him. In the Sephardi world, it's very similar. They, uh, especially in Eretz Yisrael, it's anybody that's Talmit Racham, you go to a, even if they're not religious, Secular people that are decent people, they love rabbis, they kiss their hand, they, mamash, they give them all the kavod in the world. All the kavod in the world. It's unbelievable. So, why? Because you're honoring the respect, the, the Torah that he has. Now, the rabbi may be disgusted by it. He may not like it, but he still has to allow it to do it. Why? That's part of the tradition. So, for example, there's one big rabbi. I think he's doing Zikri uh, Rabim for 40 years. One time, uh, somebody asked him, he goes, you know, you have thousands of people show up to your lectures, and a lot of them stay after lecture to come talk to you and kiss your hand. He goes, does that bother you, or you like it? And he says in an interview, he goes, to be honest with you, I think it's disgusting. He says in an interview, because I think it's disgusting. I can't stand it when people kiss my hand. But I have to do it. I hate it, but I have to do it. Why? That's the tradition, that's it. Why? You have a thousand people saliva on your hand. Who wants it? That's the tradition. That's what it is. So it's not... Why? Because you have to allow them... That's their mitzvah. That's their mitzvah. Let them do it. It's not about you getting it. If you think they're kissing your hand, then you have a problem. You don't deserve anything. You deserve a nice slap. But if you allow them to do a mitzvah, then it's good. So everything with a little bit of thought of da Torah, you're always going to see that there is a, uh, something beautiful about it. What else? We said that we'll do the Adran Alach. Adran Alach, Masechet Avot. V'adrach Alan, Da'atach Alach, Masechet Avot. V'da'atach Alan, Lo Nitshe Manach, Masechet Avot. V'lo Nitshe Minan. La Be'alma Eden, V'la Be'alma Da'ate. Yin Ratzom Yifanecha Adonai Eloheinu V'la Avotenu. Sh'teh Toratecha Umanotenu. בעולם הזה, ותהיה עימנו לעולם הבא, חנינה בר פאפה, רבי בר פאפה, נחמן בר פאפה, אחי בר פאפה, אבא, מרי בר פאפה, רב רם בר פאפה, רב איש בר פאפה, סורחב בר פאפה, עדה בר פאפה, דרו בר פאפה, הערב נא אדוני אלוהינו אל דברי תורתך ופינו ופיות עמך בית ישראל, ונהיה כולנו אנחנו בצאצאינו ותצאי צאצאינו ותצאי עמך בית ישראל, כולנו ידי שמך ולומדי תורתך לשמה נאויבי תחכמני מצוותיך כי לעולם אי לי, אי לי בי תמים בחוקיך למען לא תבוש לעולם לא אשכח פקודיך כי בם חייתני ברוך אתה אדוני למדני חוקיך אמן 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 סלע ועד מודים אנחנו לפניך אדוני אלוהינו ולאהבתנו ששמת חלקנו מיושבי בית המדרש ולא שמת חלקנו מיושבי קרנות שאנו משכימים והם משכימים אנו משכימים לדברי תורה והם משכימים לדברים בטלים אנו מעמלים והם עמלים אנו עמלים ומקבלים שכר, והם עמלים ואינם מקבלים שכר, אנו רצים והם רצים, אנו רצים לחיי העולם הבא, והם רצים לבאר שחת שנאמר, ואתה אלוהים תורידם לבאר שחת, אנשי דמים וממעל, לא יחצו ימיהם, ואני אפתח בך. יהי רצון בפניך אדוני אלוהי, שכשם שעזרתני לסיים מסכת אבות, כן תעזרני, תעזרנו, להתחיל מסכתות וספרים אחרים ולסיימם, ללמוד וללמד, לשמור ולעשות ולקיים את כל דברי תלמוד תורתך באהבה. וזכות כל התנאים והאמוראים ותלמידי חכמים יעמוד לי ולעזרי ולזרעי שלא תמוש התורה מפי ומפי זרעי וזרע זרעי עד עולם ותתקיים בי בהתחלכך בהתהלכך תנחה אותך ושכבך תשמור עליך והקיצות ההיא תשיחך כי אם ירבו ימיך ויוסיפו לך שנות חיים אורך ימים אורך ימים בימינה ושמאלה אושר וכבוד אדוני עוז לעמו ייתן אדוני יברך את עמו בשלום תזכו במצוות